And so we uh, we begin. Uh, welcome to the Concordia University War Game uh, Designer Talks. Uh, it's sponsored by the SDS, the Strategic and Diplomatic Society at Concordia University, which is a student organization of the uh, Political Science Students Association. Uh, today, I'm very pleased uh, to have uh, Professor David Isby, who's going to be speaking today about his design philosophies, in particular, uh, the uh, how to model the relationship between uh, China and Taiwan uh, uh, if it were to erupt into conflict. So the way the talk uh, today will proceed is I'm going to give a, a quick uh, bi uh, a biography of uh, uh, Professor Isby, and then Professor Isby is going to give us a short talk on design philosophy, which is going to be uh, uh, covering some general topics, but we'll cover some issues regarding uh, Taiwan and uh, China. Uh, then there's going to be a general uh, Q&A, which the audience is welcome to ask questions. And then we're going to take a 15 minute break. And the second half of the talk will be focusing more closely on uh, Taiwan or China or any issues uh, that come up uh, in the discussion. So I'm going to uh, proceed now to uh, reading the biography. Here we go. So Professor David Isby is a Washington-based attorney and national security consultant. He completed a history degree at Columbia University, an MFA at uh, Goucher, and a JD at New York University. He's written or edited 26 books and over 350 articles on national security, including three books on Afghanistan. A special correspondent for Jane's Intelligence Review, he has contributed to many military and aviation publications and written extensively on the Russian Armed Forces. He's been an adjunct professor of political science. In 1970, he became the first employee of Poultron Press, which went on to become Simulation Publications International, SPI, where he often worked as a game researcher and developer. He's a prolific designer of 21 war games, in particular of Air War, Mukden, Invasion Sicily, as well as having published a book, uh, War Game Design by Strategy and Tactics Press. And he was also an editor of Strategy and Tactics. Isby has testified before both House and Senate committees, has appeared on many television news programs, and has lectured at many military colleges. Since 1980, he's done extensive research on Afghanistan and was even condemned by the Soviet government for his writings on the subject as a, quote, bourgeois falsifier of history, and quote, a CIA agent with whom accounts will be settled, close quote. So I'm very happy today to have uh, Professor uh, Isby. So let us uh, have your uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation uh, loaded. There we go. So uh, uh, Professor Isby, we're delighted to have you here. Um, the PowerPoint presentation is uh, now visible. Um, Please share with us your war game design philosophy. <laughs> well, such uh, such as this. Thank you uh, very much. And uh, as you uh, said, in the old days, I would be able to, I could take the future, turn it into paper and cardboard, box it up and sell it to people for $15 a pop. At least I could back in the 70s when playing, designing, and thinking about war games were my major preoccupation. And during the 1973 Arab-Israeli War, we, for the first time, a war game was designed while the fighting was still in progress. And this was the game design equivalent of spearing a rolling donut. So as we talk about you know, Ukraine and potential China-Taiwan, that's what we were doing almost uh, 50 years ago. So uh, we had designed games at SPI in the 70s, such as NATO Divisional Commander, about a sign, East is Red, which is about a Sino-Soviet war, and one I designed about air war, current and future air combat. You know, so the uh, even if you can't buy them for $15 new anymore, the potential and limitations of war games for thinking about future or current conflicts is real. And paying the games does take time and effort. And it's always going to be easier to read a book, a report, 
or even something online. But game playing requires you to be an active participant, making results and seeing things go right and, much more often, wrong. Now, designing a game on a current or future subject is challenging, much more so than a historical subject where any competent game designer will try to make a game where it can turn out like the historical event. Uh, even if this requires bad luck or intense stupidity, you know, this is even though what actually happened was only one was one of a vast, almost infinite number of potential outcomes, you want to make sure that's possible. So there you start by bounding. That starts, you know, that one point gives you an idea as to what is possible. So mo with dealing with a historical subject, most designers will storyboard a design using using a historical account, especially those of maps, showing incremental movement and changes, and using them as a template. They say, okay, does my game enable the same thing to happen, uh, even though the actual events uh, may not? So there, that gives you a degree of grounding in reality that the current or uh, future game don't have to do. One thing which the current game is you've always got to know your subjects. And, you know, I've done, as you said, reference books. Uh, I did one on the uh, Soviet military. I did one of Chuck Camp's on NATO militaries many thousands of years ago. And so I'm well aware of establishing the basic facts of a situation. And for a games on Ukraine or Taiwan, that's going to be very hard to establish. Uh, making qualitative judgments uh, in a way which is going to stand up to scrutiny, which someone can't say, oh, you just you are making this up uh, is uh, is going is very hard if you someone is going to uh, uh, look at this. So it's often qualitative judgments have been known to just use to compensate for research shortfalls. So that's one of the most important things. Don't you say, well, my judgment is this, and then take the easy road. Uh, to design a game of future conflicts, you've got two basic issues, which we're going to uh, discuss here. Continuity and change. What is the nature of future conflict in general and, the and in the subject of your game in particular? Get the answer wrong, and it's defeat. Get the answer wrong, and you get what Vladimir Putin got when he invaded Ukraine. He said he thought invading Ukraine with conventional forces in 2022 would be just like invading Ukraine with hybrid warfare in 2014. Wrong. And this is the thing. What is going to remain the same, and what is going to change? Now, change is a constant. It's always so if you're looking to create a future situation, you're going to have to look at the past, but things will change there. Look, this uh, change has always been there. You know, in, since the Bronze Age, you go closed out the Iron Age and certainly brought down the tone of warfare. People and attitudes change. Putin, you know, loses because he doesn't notice or doesn't care that the Ukraine of 2014 is not the same as the Ukraine of 2022. Winston Churchill restarts his political career and gets to uh, and gets to be the man of 1940 because he recognizes that Adolf Hitler is not the Kaiser or Louis the 14th or Napoleon, but something very different. So that's key, you know, Putin had his continuity, Churchill saw the change. Uh, so what, you know, that's sort of obvious. One thing which is going to show up always is warfare remains a fundamentally, indeed terribly, human enterprise shaped by both continuity and change. This is why in classes today, Thucydides is still assigned reading. 
His portrait of the Melian debates maintain a model of statecraft and conflict, despite thousands of years being what we call in Washington left of bang. You know, in Homer, you know, it's the Bronze Age, but the same cruelty, pain, leadership, fire like angles, and stupidity depend on and off the battlefield. Uh, that reappeared in Ukraine this year. And if you wanted to uh, redo, uh, you know, the sulking of Achilles in his tent uh, with Russians trying to steal refrigerators out of old from old ladies in the Ukraine, that's probably pretty realistic. So other elements of continuity are less literary and easy to incorporate in game. We were, we were talking just uh, before this. If the fighting in Ukraine sometimes looks like the trenches in the Third Great War or the trenches in Petersburg in the American Civil War, that's not surprising. Untrained soldiers will simply create the casualty list. Direct fire weapons can, except if they're brought to close enough range, become very lethal unless you were behind a lot of armor plate or dirt. So there is a lot that's going to, so you have to say, you've got both the continuity and the change. And the challenge for you is to come up with a cohesive view of the nature of future war that does both of these. And also when you sit down, having this idea, you have to decide, and you get to, you know, this is your decision, what decisions, experiences, lessons, insights do you want the players to have? Transforming the idea of a future conflict into an actual game requires a purpose. This is not the same thing as asking what the game is about. Uh, there is room in the world for many different China and Taiwan games. Just as there are lots of games about Waterloo, Gettysburg, or the Battle of the Bulge. And if someone says, I want a game about you know, China and Taiwan, it could be about statecraft, international diplomacy, economics, including the potential effects of sanctions, coalition building, as well as the operation, military operations and tactics. Now, all of these would be different games. And, you know, I was just, when we get later on, I'm just going to run through, you can do lots of ways to do that. Is So a game could be about how Taiwan, as part of a coalition, would use multinational or national institutions to maintain the status quo and try and bring the international order to its aid, portraying the Chinese as a unitary revisionist power bent on overtraining and chaining the national international order and carrying out a conflict of imperial extension from the viewpoint of china you can you could design a game in which you aim to secure yourself and determine your will both internationally and internally if there's a game about military operations you have to address you have a challenging thing of you have to address air, land, sea, cyber, space, all the multi-domain operations, as well as high-level decision making, and you know, which is necessarily going to be complex. Is it going to be a tactical game? You can get on, you can go to a narrow focus and saying, can you turn Taiwan into a giant version of Iwo Jima? Is there going to be a prolonged guerrilla or counterinsurgency campaign? And similarly, you know, use of air and counter air combat you know, may prove uh, decisive in a war in Taiwan. And this would include the use of ballistic or cruise missiles. Amphibious operations normally fail if the enemy has air superiority. Seriously, if there's a blockade is going to work, requires naval and undersea combat. So any desire designer trying to incorporate these has to understand the technologies involved and also a way that these are different than the terrestrial land combat, which normally dominates our thinking about war games. So one of the most important decisions a game designer must make is deciding what about his subject 
has to be explicitly included and what can be built into the game or its rules of mechanics. One of the most common failures in game design, and there are many of them, is to include so much that the game basically collapses from its own weight. Even projects which have massive amounts of resources have ended up that way, such as the Department of Defense Simulation Design Effort in JSIMS. It became, to use the familiar Washington acronym, a wombat, a waste of money, brains, and talent. So it's so very easy to do that. Similarly, if you see something that works in a game and you are familiar with, you can incorporate it. These are as open to you as the colors of an artist's palette. If you are familiar with a wide range of games, it's better yet. You see how other game designers have captured complex realities and turned them into usable game mechanics. Even better, Talk to the game designers. They usually don't bite too much. And it, once you've done this for a while, you play a game and you come around saying, that's good, but I can do better. Then go out and do that. And if all the things I missed from the 1970s, the ability to play a game and say, that's good, but I'm going to do better, is perhaps the thing I miss most. Now, game designers tend to have the experience of playing games which have which are good ideas interesting subject matters but flawed rules a lot of flawed rules out there and most games yeah so a slight delay there with professor isby let's see what's going on mechanics they're going to be wasted if you aren't able to Describe them to the players so they will know what to do. In the real world, players are going to be short of time. A game must complete Pete for their attention with the rest of the universe. Unless you make it easy <coughs> for them to do what you ask of them in the game, it may well not be done. There's no substitute for testing, checking, verifying, data, mechanics, playtesting games, and developing your rules to incorporate the changes these plays, plays and indicate. Don't teach a wrong lesson through how you've written your rules. And it's all too easy that you the players doing something which is wrong uh, because it's ahistorical or not the real world option. If the if you do a game on the Seven Years War and someone wins it by making their armies march like Napoleon's. Well, you've done something wrong in your design. You know, not though the player hasn't done something wrong. They're trying to win. So the only way to address these issues is by testing the games and rules. Now, this is the process known as game development. Now, this is often the first thing that gets cut back if you are designing a game, especially those which aren't going to be published and put in a box, those which are being used for training or analysis or a class. But even games do not work without development. While any game player, this is the thing, every game player has the basic understanding to become a game designer, which is a unique thing because you know, it's not like everyone who reads a novel does not have the skills to become a novelist. But game, game players do become game designers. What sets the successful and unsuccessful designers apart? Is not originality or understanding, but too often development. And it's a different set of skills, different set of opportunities. The other thing is, if you're designing games about the future, are they going to predict what can or will happen? Well, you know, it's a cliche that all models are flawed. Some models are useful. Well, war games do have value. And thinking about future events or even as in past events, War games are not like election polling or weather forecast. Those have to be predictive and accurate to be useful. As I said, even a war game which is going to have limitations and flaws still can be useful 
in bringing out insights. And you can't, just because you don't predict the future, does not undercut your basic credibility. There's a story, the U.S. diplomat, Robert Murphy, recounted that in 1919, when he was the U.S. consul in Munich, he was asked to report on a rabble rouser in a beer hall, a guy called Adolf Hitler. So he went out to report on this, accompanied by his friend, Monsignor Peselli, the papal nunzio for Bavaria, who had received the same tasking from his superiors. And they both listened to Hitler, and they agreed, this guy has a flash in the pan, he's never going to amount to anything. Now, decades later, when uh, Murphy was the ambassador to Italy, he reminded Peselli, who was then Pope Pius XII, of their sheer predictor. And he replied, ah, yes, but that was before I became infallible. <laughs> so this is the whole thing of the difficulties of becoming predictive about strategies, operations, and anything which has so many moving parts that cannot be quantified easily or in a way that is widely acceptable. <clears throat> Prediction gets better if you focus it down. If there is thing to like a six degree of freedom modeling to determine the hit probability of a missile design, that is done with simulation, and that tends to be more accurate because the moving part, one missile simulated, is fine down. Do make thousands of different parts, and things become much harder. If games are limited in predicting future outcomes, they are similarly limited in telling you who wins. Often the weakest part of a war game is the victory conditions. The, vict the designer is tasked with something that real-world strategists often put aside as too difficult. Operation Iraqi Freedom was not won by defeating the enemy's armed forces and occupying the cities, although the operations plan appeared to have that as their victory conditions. Conflicts may change their nature rather than ending. Elsewhere, when do you judge victory conditions? If you have an American Civil War game, do you judge the war, judge it in 1865 or 1877? If you've got an Arab-Israeli 1973 war game, do you say the victory conditions are going to be judged when the ceasefire kicks in, or at the time of the Camp David Accords almost six years later. So the same situation can appear differently depending on when you do it. Now, when I offered to box up the future and sell it to you, <clears throat> you know, this is the future. As a game designer, I can promise you insights. I can't promise you accurate description, but if you give it the time and attention, I will bet you money you come away knowing things you didn't know before. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Isby. I, I was wondering, uh, um, uh, your talk um, uh, didn't coincide with your PowerPoint, so I was wondering- uh, I didn't because... use the PowerPoint. You wanna go through the PowerPoint? Well, I thought because it has a lot of elements to do with uh, China, Taiwan, do we actually want to save the PowerPoint for uh, the second half? Yeah, let's do that. And okay. uh, I'll answer your questions and uh, then we'll oh, go okay. through. We'll just run through the PowerPoint in the second half and I'll answer questions as people, things come up then, you know, rather than wait if people want to talk as I show the different slides. Well, what I'd like to do first is uh, something which I uh, which I was going to say for the second, which I'll do now, which is actually go through the games that you've designed. Um, could you uh, please stop uh, sharing? I'm going to see if I can compel that. Oh, stop. Part yeah, so I, I'm going to stop you from sharing. And what I'm going to do is share my screen. Um, there we go. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to take us through uh, some of your game designs, just because I think this will segue well into the philosophy of design, and because you've done a, you, you, you've done a great uh, number of games. So uh, these are, of, of course, a selective, uh, 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 sorry, a subjective selection by me. Uh, but I think uh, your premier game is uh, Air War. This is the uh, cover for it. 
Uh, obviously, we have uh, simulators today, uh, but even uh, even with um, uh, modern simulations, it's it's very debated. You know what the sortie rates are, as well. Um, I've not the, the 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 Warsaw Pact practice of creating two hundred mile long. Uh, uh, aluminum foil corridors for their attacks. I've never seen in in a, sim, in, a in a computer war game. I've I've seen it recently in the, in GMT's. Um, uh, uh, I think it's Red Storm. So uh, you know, even 2022, we need war games to represent strategic level air operations, which are not yet done uh, yeah. even by computer war games. This uh, is it. So yeah, that's oh. Now that's uh, see, I could have done better if uh, you know he these are miniatures which is one of the examples of miniatures. But when you have a hex, <clears throat> you know, here these guys are also moving over hexagonal uh, grid. And of course, one of the problems of <coughs> air war games are, this is a flat map and you have creed things which move up and, you know, move, pitch your and roll three dimensions. And yet you have a basically planar Playing space, so uh, it is difficulty, and it has people still. But there are advantages to actually making people say, "Now here are the forces involved." Saying this is how an aircraft will function in these things by use of mechanics, you know, which you read and move rather than that in a flight simulator program. Now there are lots of good flight simulator programs, and they have. They are used by people who can't fly airplanes, but and however they know how to manipulate the controls, but this way you are involved in the process of doing it. It's so it's not about a, a black box, but one which forces by forcing your interaction. That's where a lot of the learning experience is. Yeah, I think additionally, uh, if you're if you're not in the Air Force, and I, I I have been on exercise where I was notionally bombed by an F-18, and the referee came over and told my told me my entire column uh, had been eliminated. I didn't appreciate what aircraft can and cannot do. And the other issue is, especially if you've been in the military, they they very often quote to you how expensive the course was that you were on. Uh, pilots are very expensive. Uh, war games, uh, uh, again with a hexagonal map are an incredibly cost-effective way of teaching. Um, you don't want pilots doing this. Uh, uh, they have other things to do. Uh, so, of course, there's also your uh, Sixth Fleet. Um, and, you know, the, it, it, I, I always found the Mediterranean fascinating because uh, we can we can associate the geography with um, uh, Navy design. And, I, you know, I, I, I've often told my students that I think the Italian Navy is probably the best tailored a uh, uh, regional fleet because of the way that it's built to fit in the Mediterranean. A major part of, of your contribution to wargaming is the First World War. And so this is uh, a tactical representation oh, of the goodness. First World War, which of course I think is important because uh, it, it developments in 1917 and 1918 are still with us uh, today. Uh, you worked on uh, Tannenberg. Uh, here's the map, uh, the Battle of the Missourian Lakes. Uh, the Battle of Cambrai. Uh, the, I guess you know the green fields beyond. I mean, it, it's again you know, the the promise of, of 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 being able to break through the defenses. Uh, this is, I think, the updated map uh, for the same simulation. And of course, you've done other simulations. This is Saratoga. Um, I, I chose this one because, of course, uh, Montreal's on the map somewhere. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And you've done, you know, you've 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 uh, done your duty and and uh, contributed to Napoleonic uh, war games. And of course, uh, you've done a selection of uh, uh, conflicts in the uh, Second World War, uh, including the uh, the <laughs> Battle of the Bulge. Uh, I include Mukden here because this is one I played uh, quite a oh. long time ago. Um, uh, you know, obviously, uh, what was a war game then today still influences um, uh, Russian-Chinese relations. So this is just a, a, a selection of some of the uh, war games that you've designed. 
so um, I, I, re I remind our audience that anyone can jump in and ask some questions, but I have, I have uh, three uh, groups of questions I'd like to ask, although you know, sure. no, um, no definite uh, need to go through all of them. But uh, you've, and I, as, as I have not mentioned, um, uh, you've actually written more books than you've designed war games. And so I, I mean, you're a military analyst, and on top of that, you're a, a, a political science and history scholar. So I have a, a you know, a question of a diagnosis because you've done so much work on the First World War, and because the, the type of actions we uh, we saw in the First World War, which is uh, entrenchment heavy uh, infantry interaction, and we see a lot of this in uh, uh, Ukraine right now, and uh, I mean, I guess it, it sort of begs the question as to how much evolution and and you know what you've been discussing how much continuity is there and what explains uh, the break in continuity. You've done work on the tactical, operational, and strategic level in uh, war game designs for the First World War. So, I mean, if, if I could, you know, ask you a general question. Uh, Verdun, Battle of Verdun, the biggest battle in uh, probably Western civilization in terms of number of soldiers committed and, and the number of fatalities in basically one, one uh, location. Uh, 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 what what determined? Uh, I mean, just, just this is a heuristic. Uh, what determined the the French victory there? Was it was it technology? Was it the fact that the the democracies had had more uh, industry? Was it was it doctrine? Did the French have uh, greater will? And what are the lessons we can take from how that battle unfolded with what's going on in Ukraine right now between the Ukrainians and the Russians? Well, uh, the le you know, the, certainly the lessons of Verdun are vast. You know, one of the things, the less French looked at the lessons of Verdun and built the Maginot Line. Germans looked at the lessons of Verdun and came up with concepts which were ultimately led to their Blitzkrieg. Uh, other lessons, perhaps, <clears throat> one which might be thing is the French were able, to, the Germans set up to have a Materialschlag. A battle of material, battle of attrition. Even though they said the French have lost almost all their coal, steel, a lot of their population was trapped behind our lines and we're now using them for slave labor. So they can't stand up to it. But the French were able to be the plugged in to, you know, the global economy. They were able to bring in um they were able to bring in raw material, build up their industry, and prevail in a battle of attrition. And indeed, a year or so after Verdun, the French could not only produce more than the Germans could, they could equip the U.S. Army because even though the United States was the world's biggest economy, they weren't very good at producing weapons. So that's part of it. Ukraine is good at fighting, but like the U.S. Army of the First World War, it's got to rely on other people's weapons. So, <clears throat> you know, one could spend a couple of extra lifetimes looking at, uh, you know, at the Great War. And it is a very heuristic thing. So I am fortunate, you know, because of my demographics, you know, I'm a baby boomer. And, uh, you know, I remember all of my, my grandparents' generation, you know, for whom this was the shaping event of their lives. Well, thank you. So my second uh, uh, battery of questions is, uh, you and I have both spent time in South Asia, years in South Asia. I've never been to Afghanistan. I know, I know you've been to Afghanistan and Pakistan. You've spoken uh, with with uh, uh, policymakers in, in uh, both places. What happened in August of 2021 when Kabul fell? I mean, how could, how could NATO uh, you know, one of the best organized alliances in the world, not have a mechanism to measure the sentiment of the Afghan people. What explains that uh, very expensive outcome? Well, it's very hard. I mean, I've written five books in Afghanistan, and that would be a uh, another thing. But to a very large extent, wars in Afghanistan are fundamentally about legitimacy. And in when the United States decided basically that with the Oslo Agreement, they were cutting a deal with the Taliban and undercutting the government in Kabul, they had supported and put into power 
and relied on them from day to day, that basically uh, started pushing things downhill. <clears throat> and there were a number of other changes. There were the problems, certainly in, uh, in Afghanistan and uh, within Afghan politics. So there's a lot that, uh, you know, was there reducing. So, yeah, I don't like spending uh, weeps, uh, you know, spending a couple of weeks uh, sitting at my computer and uh, just weeping as I start reading the... Uh, uh, the Twitter feeds. Well, I mean, the Ru the Russians also negotiated with the the at that time the Mujahideen in eighty seven and eighty eight, and I, I was it the government of Najibullah. I mean, they the Russians pulled out. Yeah, and his government... they, uh, many Afghans weren't weren't going to talk to Najibullah, so the Russians cut a deal, especially with Ahmad Shah Massoud, uh, saying, "Look, we're just going to withdraw. Here is money, weapons. Now, when we you know we're just leaving, and the this." Najibula was at least had an army which was and they able to be sustained by airlift and weapons till after the end of the Soviet Union. Even once the Soviet army withdrew, the Najibula regime was able to hang on thanks to an airlift, thanks to money, and thanks to just desperation and brutality. But he, I mean, he survived four, you know, four years, I think, till 1992, when, when Gulbuddin Hakmatyar fought his way into uh, Kabul and massacred, I, I think, the, the people from Bamiyan uh, in, in a suburb of Kabul. But um, the uh, um, but it, it, it seems that NATO somehow gutted their own their own ally in Kabul. Yes, uh, and they, they did far they, worse than the Russians did or the Soviets. Yes, did. I'm afraid that they did not last. And the fact that this was the world community was united to an extent you never saw before, especially in the early days of the war. You know, 38 flags. And yet, uh, this was fundamentally, this is a very, uh, and even though it has gotten lost and it was blamed on the Afghans, this has really been a very significant failure. Could I, I mean, could I ask you two questions? One, how would you operationalize uh, what is essentially, uh, the, as you mentioned, the game of legitimacy? Um, uh, operationalize it not in a war game sense, but just you know what 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 could we possibly measure, or what what could NATO retrospectively have measured to figure out what the heck was going on? Because I, gosh, it, it, it is a shock that that much money was spent, and we had such bright people, and they got that wrong. And my my second follow-on question as a war game designer: How would you design a war game? Uh, with a rule that allows for a catastrophic 48-hour defeat after a 20-year campaign. Well, you've, you've got to, you that's the thing, the rules change. And we saw, you know, this is what, if you do, that sort of what things change. When Churchill in, you know, I think it's on the 15th of May, 1940, you know, five days, calls up the French, and he was told, we are defeated, and, you know, four days, after, four or five days after the war in the West starts. You, you know, the enemy gets a vote to set the tempo. And of course, in Afghanistan, as you know, you remember, things go downhill faster and with less stopping places than just about any place in the war world. The reason is because of the shortage of resources the shortage of trained people. There are no backups. The force to space ratio is a uh, is pretty wide, and also the Afghans will go over the bandwagon. People will want to go with the winning side. So you can have the, the rules change, and you don't get a message of it beforehand. May, may I ask? Sorry, a, that's insanely oversimplified. That's an extremely oversimplified view. But uh, you know, like I said once, you know, a war. If I was designing an, I wish you know, I have not designed an Afghan war game. But one of the key things would be just moving the meter of legitimacy, both for for the government in Kabul and for the uh, different and for the different. Uh, sides fighting and 
if you know you had each turn as a year, I'm sure you wouldn't see great most of the time great tactical movements or encirclements, but you'd aim to try and you know move the uh, move the needle of legitimacy in your direction and uh, do things like development and ec economy. In the end, Afghanistan is you know is not economically self sustaining. No, that I mean it's true. It is. It is very dependent on on uh, foreign assistance. Uh, <coughs> could you speculate I, again? This is sort of the real uh, policy world. What could NATO have done to not lose? What could? It's the raw. We played the wrong game. Uh, we, we sat down. What is the game? Remember, I was saying China Taiwan. Think what the game is. The game we were playing was something like Volcker rules a distant plane, an operational counterinsurgency. What we should have been playing is in, is in the first few years of 2004, an international level simulation in which the United States could have pulled together people who are not part of its coalition today, like China, like Iran and Pakistan. Could you have? Well, this is a game I would like to see. In in pre two thousand and five, if you had offered Pakistan something like, you know, the equivalent of the Jikpoa, which was Iran, saying here are your goodies. That we understand you have valid security interests. Here is something we can help you. And we got your Chinese people sit friends sitting with us and your Iranian neighbors, who you really don't trust, sitting with us, and this is what we're going to offer you. And that never happened. Play which game you sit down to play is crucially important. And we say this with China, you know, when we look at China, Taiwan, what, what do you want to do? Is it one which everyone is a different country? Or if everyone just, you want your convincing saying, all right, let's turn Taiwan into a giant Iwo Jima. So if, if I may extend that question to uh, uh, you know, a, a parallel case, there's, I think it's like 35, 40 million Afghans, and there's about 25, 30 million Pashtun who live in Khyber Pakhtunwa in Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan seems to have a far fewer problems governing that population, even though the population initially sided with Gandhi and were against the creation of Pakistan. So it's it, it's it's a marginally hostile population to Pakistan. The British essentially gave Khyber Pakhtunwa, uh, uh, you know, the Khyber Pass region uh, province, Northwest Frontier province, formerly uh, to Pakistan. Uh, what is it that the Pakistanis are doing, uh, did correctly, that NATO did incorrectly? Well, it's a very different thing. The Pakistanis have you know, it's the dynamics of a Pakistani government with the, you have, of course, the role of the military, the role of ethnicity, you know, Punjabi. And uh, of course, it's not just these days, it's not just, uh, you know, the uh, Khyber, what we used to call Northwest Frontier Province. You know, Karachi has become this vast conurbation with a tremendous uh, Pashtun population. So it's not just geographically limited. And, you know, the the if you just check the news recently, the Pakistanis desperately want to try and keep the lid on. And it is a it is a difficult uh, task, which we saw by the Pushtun political movements. There is a great deal of. Thought that the government there, you know, is dominated by Punjabi, dominated by the military and certainly uh the Sindhis and the Baluch are also concerned in that. So that's uh, the Pakistanis believe that the one thing that can pull their country apart is this ethnic question, which they see can be leveraged by India. You know, they see the full, you know the demise of East Pakistan, you know, East Bengal, which became as Bangladesh, as the Indians having been to do having done that. So that's why they say, look, we've got to control Afghanistan to prevent it being used. The Indians will come and leverage 
our internal Pashtun population to try and create them into a Bangladesh, an independent nation. <clears throat> and could you go to the peck and the fact is, if the Indians aren't trying to do this, and if we said, yeah, but the Indians aren't trying to do this, the Pakistan then you create a problem for the Pakistani military. If the Indians aren't doing things like this, then why are we running the country? You know, or at least you know, being the dominant force in the country. And they, you know, they cannot easily dismount. How much power can the army, or the army has no love for being hands-on governors, but uh, they've only pulled, in the years when they've pulled back from power, since the 1950s, you know, it's uh, it has tended to be transitory. Uh, can I ask you for a a judgment? A lot of the uh, you know, the, the policy wonks during you know 2000 uh, 2001 or well 2002 uh, to uh, last year argued that if only if only they could pursue the uh, Taliban into the sanctuaries in Pakistan, they could end this. You know, it's, you know the the, the Sort of like the Cambodian promise and the Laos uh, promise of cutting, you know, going into the sanctuaries. What, uh, uh, how much advantage, if any, did the Taliban get by these sanctuaries? And if counterfactually the U.S. did roll or NATO did roll into these sanctuaries in Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunwa, uh, how much of an effect would it, it have had on uh, NATO's, uh, well, NATO's uh, uh, campaign? Well, that's the thing. Crossing the border and doing it as a military operation was probably uh, would have been very difficult. If the Pakistanis had done it, you know, they could have said, would mean, as they do a case, sending a bunch of policemen and saying, you're out, go. And, you know, putting one policeman at the door of their facilities. So it would be much easier for the for the Pakistanis to have done it. But uh, the idea that bombing raids or cross-border uh, operations really could have done it, maybe taking out a few people or as a few targets, but that really wasn't going to be the answer. The answer was going to be to get a security situation that both reconciled the Afghan regime that was set up from the Bonn Accords and recognize Pakistan's security interests uh, and the same way while keeping the international uh, community involved. Now, that's difficult, but we didn't even get close. And it may not have been possible. The Pakis, you know, how much so would the Pakistanis army say, look, we got to run Afghanistan the same way Joe Stalin had to run Poland after the war. And we're next door. You're not. And this was even before, you know, in the final analysis, you know, things such as, you know, the uh, economic uh, downturn starting 2008 and uh, changes in Western opinion and the fact that the Pakistani military now has decided to throw itself in, you know, with as China is going to answer their question. You know, Pakistan has never been able to answer the question of, its inferiority to India one on one, just as sheer geopolitical uh, or military. In the 1950s and 60s, it was from their membership in CENTO and their relationship with the United States. And that incrementally went away. And after you know, the 1971 war, that was no longer viable. They have, in the same way, said, look, the Chinese are the, are the rising power. We're their old buddies. If we go along with them, we'll get what we need. Again, I'm in, oversimplifying drastically, but well, if if um, I, I've I've uh, two two remaining questions, um, I'm going to segue it into into uh, Taiwan. The um, uh, you've obviously uh, interacted with the mainstream, you know, the alleged mainstream population of Afghanistan and Pakistan. You've met people who are not necessarily tech theory religious militants. What we see in uh, Afghanistan today is you have got a Taliban regime. Uh, it's imposing uh, uh, Sharia law. This was this was not the Afghanistan, uh, even in the rural areas. I mean, you, it was certainly conservative, 
certainly, uh, you know, you didn't have high levels of, of uh, education among, among young women in the rural areas in the 60s and 70s, but you could travel as a Westerner through the rural areas of, of uh, Afghanistan in the 50s and 60s and 70s, early 70s. Um, uh, we have here sort of a, um, a, a disturbed equilibrium with the Taliban now running the government and imposing their culture how sustainable do you think it is? I mean, ha having inter interacted, how long, having interacted with the mainstream population in Afghanistan and Pakistan, how long do you think it'll take for the Afghans to, you know, uh, for the lack of a better word, mellow? Yeah, Professor Isby? Looks yeah. like his screen went black. I can't see him. Okay. Well, um, uh, let's uh, give him a give him a hint here. Let's see, a, a bit of a shake. Thank you, Professor uh, Miranda. Uh, good to have. Uh, let's see. Okay. Da, 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 da. I'm going to. Report it. So, uh, uh, Doctor Isby. Uh, given your experience in Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan, um, what can we conclude about some of these ideas that are being floated about the viability of the U.S. supporting an insurgency in Taiwan once, uh, you know, if China were to take control of a portion of the urban area? <laughs> what, what What's the prospect of that uh, strategy? Well, it's certainly difficult. Uh, the uh, West's record with a support, if you don't have a contiguous land border, supporting an insurgency becomes uh, much more difficult. And yes, uh, the, you know, bringing in arms, equipment. And of course, whereas uh, in many places like, you know, Pakistan or the Afghan border, a low level of development here in Taiwan, the country, the people, and the industrial base are part of the objective, which really wasn't the case as much in Afghanistan or many other insurgencies. So I think just as our relations to uh, people inside you know, China are problematic, or people now inside Russia who uh, how how you would support them in a uh, sustained conflict if the key parts of Taiwan are actually occupied by the Chinese is problematic. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. I think it would be a, a very dangerous and foolish idea. Um, uh, having played Professor Miranda's uh, simulation of the fifty six revolution in Budapest. And of course, you know, the huge numbers of losses, I think almost a quarter million Poles were killed in the Warsaw Uprising uh, at the end of World War II. I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, it would be catastrophic for the uh, Taiwanese civilian population. So I'd like to ask you uh, a question about Ukraine. Uh, most of your publications were uh, Cold War era focusing on the Soviet Union and uh, conflicts, uh, 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 conflicts in the developing world between uh, 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 American and Soviet-backed allies. Uh, how on? I mean, how would you characterize just generally the the type of combat that is occurring uh, in in the Ukraine? Well, it certainly differs from what you know the projections of a very large conventional war uh, in Europe. In fact, there is a large genre of literature of what a war in Europe would look like. And uh, this doesn't really fit uh, many of them, although perhaps closer to some of the things we saw in the Balkans in uh, previous uh, decades. But there is still, from the Russian side, an awful lot of continuity with the Soviet models. Uh, and part of it is, how do you get military power with a limited economic base, you know, on the day the war started, as the the Russian economy in terms of money was about as large as Spain and Portugal put together. Now, no one is afraid of Spain and Portugal put together. Indeed, they find it hard to get the European Union to answer their calls. So, 
this is was reflected by doing this. They want to have lots of things in the shop window, exercises, you know, lots of tanks, but it means things like undercutting logistics, which leads to things like the logistic failure as they tried to advance Kiev in the early days of the war. And we can see this in the Soviet model too. The Soviets relied for many of their uh, supplies at echelons above division on mobilized civilian transport. So in the 1968 invasion of Czechoslovakia, they had to mobilize all the trucks in what is today Ukraine, Belarus, for their invasion, and it ruined the harvest. So there was widespread food shortages because the trucks they were relying on to take the grain to the cities ended up having to support the army uh, in Czechoslovakia. May, may I ask about, about the, uh, I mean, you raised the issue of the economic base. During the Cold War, I believe the IISS estimated the Soviet economy at $3 trillion. And then the moment the Cold War ended, collectively, they cut the numbers in half. And so it's almost as if, it, there's, you know, essentially, it's been a guessing game. People have been giving, attributing to, to the Soviet Union numbers that people think should fit it. But really, there's no methodology uh, uh, to measure that. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I frankly find it, I, I actually don't think the Soviet Union, uh, rather Russia today, is as weak on paper as you know the equivalent of the Spanish and the Portuguese economy, or less than the, the British economy. I think it's just poorly measured. Uh, what do you think about that conjecture? Well, a lot of it is, and of course, much of the uh, what they apply for defense is so much you know, not in a defense budget, you know, which meets NATO definitions, but embedded to alternate sides of the economy. During the Cold War, it was indeed an assessment, but uh, they want to have things that you can see, sustain, and can uh, give power, you know, us, and can give them power. In the same way, I have to point to one previous historical example, uh, Mussolini to have more division reduces the size of his infantry divisions till they have six battalions of regular infantry, whereas in the Great War they have 12. This way he has more divisions to take to the conference table in the 1930s. So the Russians have the nuclear power, they have the hardware, <coughs> which also gives them export sales, but... Uh, now we are seeing on both sides the importance of industrial mobilization. People have fired off all their missiles. The Ukrainians desperately needed need more weapons. And yet, neither the Russians nor NATO and the United States are able to supply even a localized, medium-intensity conflict. So I think if one thing has come out of this war is the importance of you know, the low current version of the arsenal of democracy. And this is something which we had put aside for years in view of producing a limited number of exquisite missiles or other weapons relatively cheaply. So, I mean, since we're on the, to the topic of um, uh, technology, and you've written uh, extensively about uh, uh, technology within within doctrine, <laughs> both among NATO and uh, the Soviet Union, I. I, just as a quick segue, I, I recall at the uh, end of the, near the end of the Cold War, uh, the the um, uh, the INF Treaty, I believe it was, the Soviets had to get rid of their SS-20s, and they fired off 72 instead of dismantling them, and 100% of the SS-20s performed as advertised, and I, I think it was a bit of a shock. Um, now that we see large-scale use of Soviet weaponry in a quasi-conventional conflict, you know, in the hands of the Russians. What did you get right and what did you get wrong in the assessment of the technology? Well, and your technology never exists in a vacuum. And we knew this even before the uh, end of the Cold War. And you know, in Afghanistan, we saw uh, in 1985, while I was there, uh, the uh, Soviets were advancing up the Kunar Valley at about two kilometers a day. And this was the uh, army that, you know, said, oh, we're going to advance on the Rhine 
35 kilometers uh, a day. So, uh, yeah, we even know there was a great deal of war on papers. A war on exercise is never like the real war. So that's one thing. Again, continuity and change. Yet we also know the limitations of if you can't pay the money to exercise to be very good, there's going to be a cost. <clears throat> the United States Army is a very high cost institution because they keep people for years to train them. And they have things like sending them to the national training centers, uh, doing these big training, which the so Russians don't have a counterpart. So, uh, you know, one of the things where there is continuity is you can't get blood from turnips. Uh, so uh, I, if, if I could get you to sort of do a retrospective diagnosis in, you know, the 73 Golan and Iraq 91, it was, you know what, there's a problem with uh, Arab social culture, Arab training, Arab uh, political culture. Uh, and so, you know, if the Russians had the same equipment, they would have done better than the Syrians or the Iraqis. Uh, what, what does what we see going on in Ukraine tell us about the retrospectively, the you know, how much blame uh, uh, you know, we put on the on the 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 uh, Iraqi and uh, Syrian doctrine and organization, and how much on the technology. Well, they can at things they could use the technology for um, to just look at to go back from the Egyptians made use of the siege fire first after sixty seven and then after the war of attrition to position themselves for the 73 war. And, you know, this is where we came in trying to design a game. And at the end of the 73 war comes about, some would say, six years later, when you get the Camp David's Accords and you sign, you sign the peace treaty. So what's the game about? Is it the game of nations? You know, how much do you have? Or is it a game of, how is the T-62 limited if you don't have a whole bunch of them and working as their designers intended? Uh, but that having been said, you know, people, the Egyptians, uh, from 19, starting in 67, the Egyptians had no bridging engineer battalions. Six years later, they had a whole bunch, and they were actually quite good at crossing the canal and keeping it crossed. And, you know, engineering, being a military engineer is a skilled business, and the Egyptians do not have a whole bunch of people they can draw on, but they were able to do that, especially when you're competing on building an integrated air defense system, which, again, they started largely from scratch, and in six years they built a pretty good one. So here is a country with a lot of problems back then more even now in their personnel in their resources and while the successes were limited it shows it can be done i i i guess the the conventional wisdom is that the arab frontline states fought poorly because they have coup proofed regimes and vladimir putin's military is also coup proofed uh you know because they, they although there haven't been that many military interventions by the russian army there's the threat of it uh if, if what would counterfactually, if Putin was replaced with a democratically elected leadership, with the same Russian population now and the same technology, I mean, how much better or worse would the Russian people? I mean, obviously, counterfactually makes no sense because if you had a democratically elected government in Moscow, they probably would not have started the war in Ukraine. Um, so you know, but um, imagine they had to fight China, for example, in you know uh, around Vladivostok or Khabarovsk. How much better would the Russian soldiers be? Well, that, <clears throat> again, that's uh, certainly different. The rush political control is there. The Russians have the successes, you know, puffed, you know, to this day, the counterpart of their political officers, the old follows ons to the old Soviet political officer, even without the explicit communist thing. So political control of the armed forces is something that uh, regime, non-democratic regimes find it hard to uh, bring about. Even in democratic regimes, it is quite often a, a challenge. Uh, especially as you look, you know, places in French, 
in the French, you know, in the end of Algeria, in the crisis that brought about the end of the Fifth Republic. So it's not just limited to uh, dictators and banana republics. So how you can embed automatic political control, I don't know. But a, uh, a future democratic Russia, where is the continuity and where is the change? That's something, this would be something good for a game designer. We, or you might want to have, get a bunch of uh, subject matter experts and set up uh, an access to tabletop game, or perhaps a loose, a loose Kriegspiel uh, type approach. So a few more Ukraine questions. Did you get the early war situation correctly? Uh, did you think <coughs> the Russians were going to steamroll Ukraine in two weeks? or not? Well, uh, yeah, like I said, I was actually, like most people, was looking for a more hybrid warfare uh, sort of threat rather than battalions of tanks going across the border. Uh, and of course, why, what had been the changes, the other things which was less obvious were the changes in the Ukrainian military that had taken place since 2014. Now, we knew they had pictures, there had been NATO exercises, there had been increased cooperation. In fact, the supply of a limited number of Javelin anti-tank guided missiles had become a major political issue in the United States. The first impeachment in the post regime. So we knew there was something going on, but uh, we really didn't think there was this degree of change. So we had a, a Ukrainian military willing to fight and a Russian less able to. So uh, perhaps the, you know, the drawbacks of the Russian regime, aside from you know, the logistics, you might have guessed. The other things uh, might come as more of a surprise. So uh, how would you diagnose uh, what, what looks like uh, the the... Uh, extreme, I would say the, the extreme NATO strategy, which is to keep this war going for as long as Ukraine can bear it until there's a coup in Moscow. First of all, do you think that is the plan or, or a plan of some people? Um, and is it viable or hopeless? I mean, some like Mearsheimer say, and Pose, Barry Posen say, no way, it can't possibly uh, turn out that way. No, but I'm a, you know, most wars since 1945, have resulted in some sort of a negotiated settlement. And I would not be surprised if in the near future, the Russians go and propose a unilateral, you know, unilaterally say, we're going to do a ceasefire and we're going to, you know, and dig in on these lines. Let's negotiate from here. And it's actually the same as the, the Egyptians in 1967. Yeah, you don't like where you are, but let's uh, stop, talk, and at the same time, get ready to do it again in, you know, six years. So, uh, again, I'd like to remind our guests that, uh, if, you know, they could jump in and ask uh, questions. Um, I, have, I have one last question uh, before, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take a break and then, and then pick it up after. And I, I asked this to uh, all of the, all of our uh, war game uh, designers. Uh, was the war in Vietnam winnable? And I, I mean, you, you remember the conflict. Uh, was it winnable um, if we swapped in the army from 1982 um, instead of, or 1992, instead of the army that, that we had then? Uh, was there a formula uh, that the US could have pursued that would have resulted in South Vietnam prevailing over the North and being here today? You're probably, again, playing the wrong game. You know, playing the tactical, nice tactical game, play the game of you, this one like Afghanistan. If you were going to win, play the game of nations in the 1950s. What could you have offered given to North Vietnam? So rather than signing up with the Russians, with the Chinese to what to, you know, pay vast amounts to reunify the country. What alternative could you say? OK. Would it be possible? These we realize. These are your interests. Let's see how what you can do without uh, destroying everything, costing. It may not have been possible, 
And in fact, as we know, one reason why Ho Chi Minh and General Giap, the great victors against the French, uh, lost out in an internal power struggle by the late 50s. And we weren't, <coughs> no one was aware of this in the United States until quite recently. So it may have been our intelligence was not adequate for us to do it. But again, once you're looking at moving battalions and tanks, then you're playing the wrong game. The real game is how do you line up? What can you offer them? Whether it's money or nationalism or realist foreign policy, but you've got to decide what game you want to play. So sorry, just to pursue it a bit more, because it was such a, uh, a, a big event at the time, uh, uh, what, could, what could have been offered or uh, done in South Vietnam to make them more effective? Well, again, it was a particularly difficult thing because unlike Afghanistan, you were succeeding a, you know, you appeared to be succeeding a colonial regime. And this was, you know, at the high point of late industrial, you know, the ugly American and the late industrial. So we really felt that our way of doing, the American way of doing things would endure as it didn't emerge like it did in South Korea. Although there, it you know took much longer and required you know many decades you know of uh, army or non uh, democratic rule. So, uh, um, I, are are you suggesting that um, there's a there's a, a potential model of success in South Korea? I, I mean, at this time, South Korea uh, appeared. You know, even though the the success of South Korea was much more limited. Yes, that, that appeared, this is what would be the end state. Today, South Korea is a prosperous and democratic country, uh, was not the case in 1965, but uh, you know, even so, and today you could say, even though they have a security threat, here is something where the American commitment contributed to stability. All right, perfect. So, uh... Uh, Professor Isby, I think we're gonna uh, we're gonna uh, cut it here. And okay, we're back. So Professor uh, Isby now is gonna take us on a more fine grained look at uh, war gaming, um, a Taiwan China uh, conflict scenario. And for that, we have a, a presentation, and then we'll take uh, questions uh, after. So uh, Professor Isby. Well, thank you. I'm just, uh, you know, we talked about some of the general considerations before of wargaming, the continuity and change to the degree at which it can be predictive or look, provide insights. So we're going to look at what we, what kind of a China-Taiwan game we could have uh, from classic operational war games to global or even ones involving individuals. So, uh, you know, this again, the game designer has multiple options depending on what they're doing. Uh, you were just talking about if you're doing it for a class and you're looking for one hour to involve large numbers of people, that's going to be a very different solution from one which you're going to put in a box and sell. So and this uh, shows another, uh, someone else's Taiwan <clears throat> China game. And what are you going to use <coughs> for these games? And I'm just, for those who aren't familiar, I'm going to talk in terms of the game boards, playing pieces, rules, and subordinate things, displays and indices, which allow you to quantify it, or cards, which uh, can show changes in the outside situation or be used to resolve other mechanics. Now this is, uh, like I said, I've just picked up a few examples, a basically <coughs> an operation 
fictional game of Taiwan, an operational Taiwan, you see the map there, uh, for an operational war game. Notice also that the Chinese coast, you know, it sort of defines what you're looking for. The Chinese coast isn't there. There is an off-map display for some of the surrounding regions. But this appears to be a game that's going to focus on a land, on the amphibious invasion. You can see the uh, uh, invasion beaches and uh, where you and how you do it from this. So this is a get, looks like an operational mil, uh, military approach. Here is something else when you perhaps bring back the focus a little. This now Taiwan in this game is one island. And you're dealing with a larger Chinese, the regional bases such as Okinawa, possibly the Philippines. And uh, you could also need not just be a two-sided uh, China and PR PRC and Taiwan. You know, you could involve, this could be a situation in which Japan appears as a player or Korea, uh, other players in the region, Australia, Canada. You could bring them involved as well, too, as a multiplayer. Uh, game. But here you see also fewer large, instead of covering it with lots of small hexagons, you've got lots of larger ones. And this way you could have more abstracted mechanics uh, for dealing with the air to air combat, who gains air superiority over the straight blockade, who blockaded. Taiwan with submarines, mining, surface warfare, all these alternatives. Another approach, this again is someone else's game, but here again, we bring the focus closer in to show someone who's having a battle for Taipei. And a uh, you're certainly a familiar a uh, tactical approach. If you look, it has air credit. And the question is, is this a way which you, as the game designer, you're going to have to decide whether this is something in which the treatment of aircraft, the treatment of naval, amphibious, all this is something which works out the way you want to or the way you think a uh, Chinese-Taiwan conflict is going to look like. On the other hand, if you don't want to do the specifics you know, we saw with specific units, air and naval, you could look for a card event-driven game. Now, this game is, in fact, is an ancient, uh, is the ancient Mediterranean, <clears throat> but here using pathways and areas for movement and cards to set up events is approach even though it was the example I've shown here is from the Punic Wars, it is something that would also apply, you could apply this to China, Taiwan, or other contemporary situations. Now, this is another approach. This is from Mark Herman's Churchill game, which has the big, which again uses a combination of a display for relationship between the big three, uh, US, Soviet Union, and Britain, and uh, two more were showing uh, geographical locations, which are shown not with units, but by uh, specific indicators. So while this is an event-driven game of inter-allied diplomacy, uh, this is something you could have you know, with the US, Thai, China, and Taiwan, you could easily reimagine this with uh, these showing the indicators. So this is another way you could approach a game with China and Taiwan. Now here is <clears throat> SPI game from the 70s, Canadian Civil War. And it was a stylized display. You see no, no map, 
but they're all pure indexes. This time, the indices, which are normally off to the side of the map board, have here consumed the whole thing. And the geogra geography is designed in rather than being explicitly sewn. And this is a game of potential future Canadian politics, which did not come to pass. But uh, another approach, and this is uh, simulation Canada's Quebec Libra, and here they put the indices off to the side, and you still have the, uh, you know, still have a recognizable map. But again, it's a political primarily game of who, you know, elections, control, and uh, who can put in place uh, different policies. Another game which uh, might be relevant, which you could actually use as a model for China, Taiwan. This is another 1970s game, The Plot to Assassinate Hitler, in which the playing map represents a political geography of the Third Reich leadership and a stylized representation of the places that were key. And if you want, if you want to do your PRC Taiwan un game as from the view of the Chinese, you can make this Beijing. That the play, the real play is not going to be on the island or with air superiority, but with the but with the Chinese government increasing its power, stabilizing, getting its policy aims, of which Taiwan may only be one of many. So if you want to have a Beijing focus, just as this has a Berlin focus, this is a way you may want to go. Another option, a game from uh, another game designed by a comedian. This is a game aftershock. It's a cooperative game uh, dealing with humanitarian relief uh, after an event, which in this case is an earthquake. However, <clears throat> I was looking and saying, gee, the people are all playing on the same side, but have their own different objectives, but have to coordinate and work together. I said, couldn't you do this for, say, Ukraine, in which of the five players who are the different uh, organizations dealing with the earthquakes, you could have five people, the, you know, the United States, Germany, Britain, uh, all NATO, you know, or a more general NATO, all trying to have parallel policies to deal with the Ukraine conflict. So this is a cooperative game. You know, not one side is not the enemy, but the question is how do you all work together towards a common goal, even when those goals differ. So this, again, even though it is not dealing with a kinetic war, you know, this is something which, if you may wish to do your PRC, Taiwan thing, this could work for you. And finally, I'm going to bring the focus way down. This is Le Poilu. It's a cooperative game of infantry in the Great War, in which the players are individual French soldiers. And again, it is a cooperative game. You have to carry out tasks together. You know, there are no German players. But if you want to bring the focus, if you want, you want to show is share in the individual experience. Uh, this may be the sort of approach that you could make this instead of uh, French infantry in the Great War. You could go all sort of black cube and do this with Russian infantry in Ukraine. Here and yes, it may involve stealing people's refrigerators. Uh, or how do you fight when you, you know, how do you fight in a war in which you are being left out in the middle of Ukraine? with a system that is failing. So oh, that is another approach 
that the game designer can use. Another option is the mat a matrix game in which you are looking at the relative position of forces and events rather than using a map to specifically carry out uh, military operations. And yes, you could certainly have uh, a <coughs> PRC Taiwan matrix game. And uh, you know, which again, there are books on this and it is also you know, quite often used uh, to just show some of, you know, look at one or two key decisions. Now I've used the Balkans this is the Baltic Sea as a map, but uh, you could easily have China, Taiwan, and again, places like Philippines, Okinawa, where there would be bases, a U.S., where the U.S. 7th Fleet would be involved. So you could even put those involved, put those in. Finally, you could say, look, China, Taiwan, China is only part of a globe more large structure, you could remember I said, let's bring the focus real in to the individual in Le Poil, you're using Le Poilu as a model. Now we're going to do the exit, the opposite. Bring the focus as far out as it will go and show games involving the entire world. Yes, and they include Taiwan. If you say no, <coughs> Taiwan is only a small part of the struggle, whether it's the rise of China or the democracies, you know, or the international changing international order, you can show Taiwan as what you is, is a small part of a larger process. So this is another alternative for the game designer could approach. So this is another way. This is a way you can do China Taiwan with Taiwan being only a single hex or box. Now counters. Now <clears throat> most counters people have numbers, e explicit military units, uh, which have a quantifiable factor of their ability to move, shoot, communicate, other things, you know, information warfare, but it's not the only way. Certainly, most uh, standard war games have this approach. This is another ta China-Taiwan situation. You can see the little Chinese flags indicating what's under their control. But uh, you could play with other things as well. For example, meeples. Uh, these are used in things. Uh, they are used in other games mainly Euro type games for interaction. If the shock uses these, this is where you don't need a quantifiable uh, number on your playing piece. Cards, cards are important. Cards can have a broad range of function. They can provide information more than a counter can. They can inject, ingest, they can show you Events, if you have to pick a card every time, could have bad weather, could be a random event. And so it can actually be used to simplify and incorporate things which would otherwise require explicit game mechanics, which will involve more time, more player effort. Rules. You know, wargaming is an act of communication. That's what Peter Perla says. And if you're going to communicate, you need rules. And this is important because in many games, the weak point is the rules. Uh, the thing is, if the alternative is to have, there are other games where you don't need quite explicit rules. Things like the Matrix games, in which you have a facilitator, or a loose Kriegspiel, in which there are outside experts and which may or may not have rules on how they're going to resolve combat or non-combat. So rules are, are key. Other thing you have to decide as well as how you're going to represent things 
is where your space is going to be. This is the spectrum of conflict, a well often used phrase. So you're going to have to say where you're going to focus, whether it's going to, which could be, you can be, you can try and get all of it in, or you can focus just on a limited amount. A, you know, cut a slice. If you're going to get more of it, you get more flexibility, but it's going to limit the chat, the uh, your ability to keep it within a thing. The, you will run the risk of things collapsing because you're trying to do too much. At levels of kinetic war, you know, this is another thing. What is your design space? Uh, run from strategic grand strategic down to technical and this is sort of parallel to what we were looking at at the different game approaches the grand strategic there you have your global map down at the bottom you have your map of taipei or your le poilu where you're an individual soldiers in an individual trench and the rest between that So among the issues, now this is the issues if you're going to be, I've just put this here. They're not going to go through it, but these are among the issues you are going, will be have to be addressed or not addressed for a China PRC design. But if you don't address them, you will have to answer, how do you take these things are significant? If you're not covering them, how are they taken into account? Are they built into the system? You know, are they not important? You have to answer that question. Rules. And again, there's alternatives. Yes, you can have the explicit rules. These are, you know, the commercial war game. These have to be the clearest because they're being sold you know, they are an arm's length tra uh, transaction and the designer has no further in-person involvement there. They could be facilitated rules. We talked about the matrix simulations. Creek spiels, which are the adjudication, moderation with pre-existing charts and data sets. If you're interested in historical periods, 19th century creek spiels are great sources of detail. Loose creek spiel requires judgment, less reliance on specific rules, but you have to have guidelines. You know, again, usually there are guidelines, and the fact is, many of this may not, many of the things used to guide the adjudication may or may not be true. You, it depends on what sort of a verification process they've gone through. And these consider what do you expect the player to learn and understand. Again, a one hour classroom game is going to be very different from the things sold uh, in a box. Which reflects again, what the game is primarily for education, training, analysis, enjoyment, insights, or as we were saying before, prediction. So again, these are the things when if you're designing a China-Taiwan game, you'd have to keep in mind. <coughs> and here, what we've got a few viewpoints which you can look at. Uh, for, uh, so what do you need to be, what to be included? And quite often, less is more. If you put in, you know, like I said, as you start putting in things up, complicate it as much as you need it to be, but then, you know, no further. Everything needs to be, you know, simplicity is good because otherwise you're undercutting your more overall process. And here, issues of manual war games. There are some things that manual war games do not do as well as computers. Uh, and some of it is, it's very hard to repeat check accuracy. You've never seen a war game with footnotes, even though probably it would be a good idea. Limited intelligence, 
the effects of planning. And of course, uh, much of the planning process does not necessarily appear in the game itself, even if you're not training people to be planners or staff officers. Logistics, communication, bookkeeping, it does things like ammunition supply are really tend to be very time consuming in a manual war game and should be used very sparingly when the situation actually requires it. And game designers need to answer the question, Ed, like I said, when you are doing your, you know, PRC Taiwan game, aside from what level you want to do it, how you're going to represent it, you've got to answer these questions. What do you want to show? And finally, you've got to test it. And this is one of the more important things. Uh, this is a picture of an SPI playtest session from uh, 1971. And I spent many years in the 70s, especially on Friday nights, playtesting games at uh, SPI. And that's how play games differ basically from books, which is you know, there is a specific process for research, writing, and only when you finish a book, a game is basically iterative and reiterative with the players. And without your, look, I designed a lot of war games. Without play testers, without people to help me, I would have designed exactly zero. You know, the game designer is, in my view, complete, you know, in the, at least I was. I was dependent on the people who played the games saw which of my mechanics worked and were brilliant, which ones were really stupid and collapsed. And then next week, I wrote new rules, tried it again. So that's the thing. I needed that rapid fire iteration. Now, some people, maybe that, there are gamers, war gamers who are that brilliant. They can all do it in their heads and don't need that. That wasn't the way I did it. And finally, you should all do this. If you hear this, you should go out and design war games, especially of current or future situations. Why? Because it's a lot of fun. It is a great th it's thing to collapse and if to create. And if you are a war gamer, you have the skills you need. It's a direct hands-on experience. So uh, I urge you to do that. So anyway, I'd be happy. These are just a very brief run through. Like I said, you've got the, I have, I hope people who are seeing this can go through and look at the view graphs at the, their leisure, but I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Professor Isby. I mean, it's a lot to talk about. Uh, I'm going to skip one of the questions in the chat, which is the uh, role of uh, cigarettes in uh, game design. Uh, which is in your picture. So uh, we've got uh, two questions. Uh, I'm going to uh, first go to see if uh, Mr. Dennis is uh, with us um, or if he's correcting student papers at this instant. Uh, and I, I couldn't help myself there. I noticed one person had a cigarette and everybody seemed to be in really uncomfortable wooden chairs. I think that's part of getting people to focus on the game as well. <laughs> it did, didn't look like a comfortable situation. Um, yeah, so uh, the, my big thing is on the play testing, right? There's a lot of discussion out there. You know, how much do you need to play test a game? I guess you know it when you see it. But, um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of discussion back in the old SPI days, you know, complaints about some games not being tested enough. And then other games that were maybe overcooked to the point where, um, they were they were stuck in one track and there were, wasn't a, there weren't a lot of options you could use in some of these games because they were trying so hard to replicate the historical track record. Um, I guess it's not as much of a problem with modern games because you're trying to fight a conflict that hasn't happened yet. But I just want to get your thought on how, how much is enough. Oh, and, and this is hard. for anybody here, Joe or, or, or Chuck or anyone. I think it's, like I said, it is hard to say. It depends on the game. And sometimes uh, you basically, 
have to take the, the testing can show that things aren't working out and you have to go back a few steps and take it away and do massive uh, redesigns. I've seen really very few games that come away over play tested. It depends on the design, a relatively simple game system. Some of the designing can be done by people who you aren't physically there. Things like victory conditions and those, you know, see what is balanced or what isn't. That may work with non remote testing. Uh, but, you know, I tell people, green, you know, if green feels beyond work, it was because of my play testers. I had some very good play testers. And uh, I created a, my fir first designs. I had some, after I got a first play tester, uh, someone had a British plan, which literally took the entire German army out in the first turn. And the German player was just sitting there doodling as he watched his army disappear in a very, uh, you know, non-1970 approach. But uh, from that bitter experience, both my I went back and said, "Okay, time to readdress what I have here." So, uh, and that's the thing: if you are doing a basically simple game, you know, I wouldn't say simple, but something aiming for a one-hour term, it's uh, you for games which can be played into a pl classroom. You know, again, you need to have a good basic idea as to what you're doing before you let it out. For me, it was um, it was more the uh, the idea that when you're a designer, you're so close to the design that you just assume that other people know what you're thinking. And the first time you have somebody go through and say, "Well, how do you do this?" and you say, "Oh, well, it's easy. You just oops, it hasn't been covered in rules." So it's a, it's a check on your uh, your uh, being able to tighten up the design. Can I interject? Please. Uh, what I was going to say was that, like, it seems to me it's always the, the last hundred yards that makes the difference. We have to fine tune it to the point where the game actually works and you deal with all the minor errata. So it's like you could, you, you could 90 percent of it's in the design, but it's that last 10 percent that really counts that makes or breaks the game. But I also think there's a certain point where you, you realize it's finished, you put it in the box. And <laughs> at this point, well, that's what we have errata for, you know. Yeah, um, but just a quick question. How many of you have, you know, asked your play testers to try to break the game? In other words, do something, if it's a historical game, do something, you know, ahistorical to see if it, if it will work or do something that is defies conventional doctrine to see if it'll work outside the parameters of what you, you were looking for. I don't for. think you have to ask them. They just do it. Yeah. Give them yeah. the victory conditions. And that's when you learn a lot and you're saying, wait a minute, this guy has just won the game doing something that the actual commander did not. Why is this? Uh, and you may say, oh, I forgot, you know, yes, there's something I haven't incorporated or there is something I am portraying that is not realistic. So yeah, give him the victory conviction and say, do you know they're gamers? They want to win. I told them, don't just you know, they and they know that. So they, and if things aren't working out, you've got to go back and think why, and not just say, well, you know, a, not just blame the players or commend the players. I, I'm gonna add one other thing. Whenever I play test somebody else's game. Find the defender. I always go on to the offensive to see if that will turn the whole thing around on the first turn or two. That's a that's a great idea. Yeah. Can you um, you know, of course. And once again, then you ask yourself, maybe they just didn't think of that at that time frame. They didn't realize they had the the offensive potential to do something if they had if they had taken the chance. You, I always think of little round top right, fixing bayonets and charging downhill you know conventional wisdom would not have said that's the smart thing to do you're out of ammo but in you know battlefield expediency that's what directed joshua chamberlain to do that so right 
Sorry, Mr. Uh, Dennis, uh, can you uh, comment, uh, perhaps want to comment on air war? We were having oh. a discussion prior. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, like I said, I used to I used to have air war. It was interesting because it was pro it's probably the most I don't know if there's been one since that, that I don't know about most detailed game, at least on modern jet, you know, combat that's out there. And it really forces you to think in in three dimensions, even though you have basically got um, you know, these little blue pieces of paper with hexes that represent sky, you don't even really see terrain or anything at, at most, in most of the scenarios, unless you're doing ground attack. Um, it, it took me a while to wrap my head around it. Of course, I was a teenager at the time when that came out and some of the concepts in there. Um, I, I don't remember from your designer notes, I mean, how much did you actually have actual pilots try to play that game. I know you talked to actual pilots in the design, but did you ever have any actually try to play it to see if they thought it replicated jet air combat well? Well, yeah, and actually this is something we mentioned. So a couple of years after I did Air War, I went, I got a pilot's license, I learned to fly an airplane. And certainly not a jet airplane. You know, most of my flying is about you know, 104, I have a 140 hour uh, Piper Arrow, horsepower Piper Arrow, but the basic idea of this is how, what a, what flight is like, the maneuvering of flight, even if you are, you know, going only at, you know, 120 miles an hour rather than several hundred. So, and again, it brought home, I must say, it did not bring, I didn't say, oh, this is something I should have understood. It's just the difficulty of simulating within turns, within paper, something that's basically three-dimensional, fluid, and many moving parts <clears throat> at once. As you're we saying, as I was saying earlier in one of our previous discussions, look, there's lots of Canadian very good Canadian game designers, but not one of them has come up with a really good man-to-man -man hockey manual game because it's this, even though it, they, you know, it's only on, they're only skating. They don't go up and down or pitch your and roll. You've got multiple actors all acting independently at the same time. And it's very, it's a very hard thing to simulate. And it didn't stop James Dunnigan from doing scrimmage, though, right? <laughs> no more vibrating football boards, thank God. Um, yeah, and, and the thing is that, you know, I don't think we'll see a game like Air War again because the, the flight simulators on computers are so realistic and um, at least give you the impression of realism. I think people are going to do that. It's a shame because I thought it, it was interesting as, as far as the mechanics of flying. Um, and it, there were a lot of good scenarios in there as well. So, well done. Well, I think like a, like a pit crew in a car race, probably the biggest force multiplier are sortie rates. And we really don't have a lot of information on, on you know, what those true rates are. If you look at Harpoon, airplanes somehow get completely refurbished in 60 minutes. And so you could have aircraft flying three or four times as, as frequently as the Israelis did in the first 24 hours of the Six Day War, which is absurd, of course. I mean, those airplanes would completely fall apart. Uh, but it would be curious to have a management war game of a, uh, you know, the, the, the very exciting job of a crew on an airfield. You know, the engineers filling holes and the, uh, the, the mechanics, uh, you know, tightening screws and the, 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 the um, the planning crew trying to you know figure out uh, 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 you know what the next mission is going to be and the of course the the medic giving out methamphetamines to keep the pilots away. Um, that's well, that I, don't think I mean, this ever would, done that. that issue, of course, is something anyone who does a uh, Taiwan PRC game is at least going to have to think of for the air superiority battle. How all right? Maybe you can do seven sorties a day for the first day. Or and go close to it for the first three, but how long can the Chinese and the Taiwanese each sustain the sortie rates? And uh, that is, you know, that is a crucial pro issue. And how are you? And if you, how are you going to determine this? 
obviously it's nothing we know. And if you say, all right, I'm going to assume these, uh, is that going to, un and you get it wrong, because most assumptions are wrong, is that going to uh, undercut the rest of your, your uh, simulation? I had you know a, um, a wargaming course that I gave, and I had a uh, student from Singapore who did create just such a game it was for managing resources to generate sorties. That's brilliant. I imagine. I imagine it's a it's a student paper, so it, it's protected by privacy. And I imagine he never, uh, or she never published it, or made it public. No, it was never published. But I think I still have it around. Yeah, that would be actually actually uh, brilliant. I mean, it's uh, uh, it, it's it's not it's not information that we have available. I mean, I, I think there's many dimensions to it. The Iranians, of course, have kept the F-14 flying. Um, you know, by by somehow engineering the, the the parts that wear out, which is fairly remarkable. But that, of course, is a, a different skill set than actually keeping them flying um, in sort of an acute sense, acute failure of, of airframe sense. Um, well, the, the, well, there's another thing here, too, with all this. And I've seen it with um, Compass Games, South China Sea system. And a similar system that the Marine Corps uses, their operational wargaming system. I've witnessed a couple of those games. I'm not sure if GMT's uh, Next War series does the same thing. But players tend to, in the first round, fire everything off. It's use it or lose it. Because there's not going to be a carrier to generate more sorties. If they get hit by D21s, it's all over. So everybody tends to throw every bit of ordinance they have in the first turn or two they fire off all their defensive systems in the first turn or two, and then there's not much left. If it isn't sunk, then it's it's out of ammo, and there's this very much use it or lose it mentality that it's that we're not going to be playing a, you know, a game that's going to go five or six turns because either it's going to be at the bottom of the ocean or um, we're going to have to go back and refit someplace. And uh, I've also seen I, I, in Next War. Um, the um, the folks down at Marine Corps use the Next War series um, to to run some operational war games with students and the casualty rates calculated casualty rates based on the game which you know depending on how accurate it is were in the you know there were thousands and thousands of casualties no military could sustain that for more than a few weeks so I mean is, is some of this stuff moot is is modern warfare really going to be that intense if it's force on force between competent nation states. So Professor Isby, can you can you uh, move your yeah I think slide? we saw we've right. seen many of these key first couple of issues. Yes, the state we've seen this uh, in Ukraine in which everyone is, even though it's only a very more limited war, everyone is running out of ammunition. And no one has invested in either the size of the stockpiles and also to do this, or also keeping them secure. One of the things that the Russians did aim to do in the opening stages of the war was to take out the Ukrainian munition stockpiles. And they got some of them, uh, and indeed, it, but uh, others had dispersed. Indeed, we now know they spent years sabotaging ammunition stockpiles throughout Central Europe before this war. So this is something else that's given us a greater sense. But yeah, war games have no tomorrow. You have, you know, they have every in, in the real world, you need to keep your force intact for the next battle or the next war. In a war game, once you put the game back in the box, that's it. Sorry, Professor and you don't have to care about the institutions. Sorry, Professor Isby, can you can you move your PowerPoint presentation to one of the maps, one of the visuals of Taiwan? Um, just because it, it would be, uh, uh, yeah, this one here, this is perfect. Uh, I, I have played this with my students um, about five or six times, and half the time they do uh, do the amazing thing of not sending up any Taiwanese aircraft. But uh, you know, it's it, it's it's a it's a you know a, a big debate. Uh, even for people who operate on airfields. I, I was an army engineer and we did a, a I guess a two week thing where uh, as an army engineer, we were playing air force engineers and we were uh, looking at arrestor gear you can stick on a highway and sort of magic cement 
that you could pour into holes, like, you know, the Seabees in, in the Pacific in the Second World War. But uh, frankly, I, uh, none of us had access to, to data as to, you know, what we were expected to do and how fast. I mean, it was, there was so many unknowns. And I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm looking now at the, the Canadian and uh, the U.S. Uh, Air Forces deploying in the Arctic or, or dispersing on Pacific islands uh, in anticipation of, of a larger conflict and just seeing how it goes. Um, and and uh, apparently they're able to redeploy with just a skeleton amount of uh, maintainers, which I think would you know work for a short a short term um, a short term conflict. Uh, so, uh, 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 Professor Kemp, you had a question also. Oh, I, I can address this. Um, uh, certainly, the Chinese want to crater all the uh, runways on the, what would be the first turn of a war. Um, if you expand all of this greater and, and add the United States to it, uh, one of the things I did for our um, planning exercise at, uh, at uh, ACSC was, was uh, look up a lot of the, uh, a lot of the air facilities that will be available throughout the Pacific for uh, US forces to use. And the Chinese better have a lot of missiles and they better all be able to take out what they think they can because there are a lot of places that we could use. And I didn't even approach the ones that had like less than, uh, less than a certain uh, number of feet of, of, um, of, of runway space, so. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Camps. Sorry, did you have a question from earlier? Uh, before oh, oh, it's um, air warfare? No, I just I had had a comment about the uh, the, the Ukraine and, and the Russians. Um, please, please. Uh, the late John Tiller, whose um, whose uh, uh, design house uh, was was uh, commissioned by the government to um, to do a study of Russia versus uh, the Ukraine back in the eighteen nineteen time frame, um, make up a war game there. He subcontracted me to do research on both sides uh, using uh, uh, the same thing that uh, Dave and I did when we did our NATO book, what the Soviets used to call the foreign military press, which um, it, it was amazing. I, I looked at it and I looked at the Ukraine uh, our, uh, armed forces. And I said, these are not pushovers. Anybody who thinks that these guys are going to roll over you know, when the bully kicks sand in their face, it's got another thing coming. And um, when you look at their order of battle, their equipment, their training, uh, it was, um, it, it impressed me. And I, and I, I don't know how they, how they carried that forth in the war game, but, um, but I was certainly impressed with it. So when was that? This was the 2018-19 uh, timeframe. I had just retired, and uh, and Tiller offered me a very handsome sum of money to do the research. <laughs> no, it's fun to get paid to work in. Oh yes. <laughs> so, uh, Professor Isby, I have uh, uh, you know focusing now on putting the lens on uh, the China Taiwan conflict. I've, you know, I've got some uh, uh, several general questions. Given your uh, scholarship and your writing on uh, uh, Soviet doctrine and equipment, and what we see in Ukraine today. Uh, how would you assess the, you know, the, 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 the big ticket items like the tanks, the artillery, the airplanes, the ships between Taiwan and China? I mean, how, how should we, ex how, how could we anticipate how the Chinese weapons are going to function? Well, you know, the, uh, certainly you look at the nearest foreign counterparts, you know, obviously some of the Soviet styles uh, material you've seen in combat in Ukraine, Syria, other places in the Middle East. Uh, otherwise, you know, use that as a uh, stand-in. The other thing being uh, seeing how it all works together. If the, uh, you know, we know the Chinese have three aircraft carriers and six nuclear subs, but uh, the indications that they can, uh, that they can function the same way as their U.S. counterparts or our allies. Yeah, that's a lot less forthcoming. So, uh, I mean, I, I, of course, I, I don't want to um, uh, 
uh, you know, a, a appear too aggressive. But if I could push you on it, yeah. Um, do you think you think the Chinese are Chinese? I mean, uh, the Chinese tanks in some ways have the automatic loader. Um, are are the Chinese vehicles? I mean, just just sort of guesstimate. Um, are they just uh, uh, Soviet tanks with a paint job, or no, do you the actually Chinese think... have had access to the world economy for that long, whereas the Soviets, so they have certainly gotten a lot of things that the Soviets, who had very specific national requirements, did not. So I, so the Chinese may have new ideas in both technology and tactical approaches. Whether they have trained enough to make these tactical approaches uh, something they could do in combat, that is a very open question. I don't know the answer to that. Do you think we can generalize from their performance uh, in the Korean War? Or is, that, is that like too long ago? We're going back <laughs> to the thing, Continu yeah, continuity and change. And, you know, like I said, the, the great problem here is that sometimes something as old as the Iliad is germane, you know, thousands upon thousands of years, whereas, you know, old Putin found out that 2014 was no longer germane. So, uh, yeah, so I would you know, look at what are the constraints? What were the constraints? In the Korean War, it was a hastily improvised Chinese army. In fact, many of the personnel that were encountered uh, by the US were former uh, KMT Chinese nationalist troops who had been taken prisoner and allowed to redeem themselves by fighting the Americans. Uh, so it's the it's the difference. Similarly, looking at the war in uh, with Vietnam in the late seventies is looked upon perhaps as the last gasp of the Maoist People's War approach. You have to look at what the Chinese are expecting their forces to do now. Uh, they really haven't had any experience of joint warfare. And they're expected to undertake one of the most difficult things uh, in the military lexicon, which is amphibious operations. Uh, and and that's, that's a whole order for an army that really doesn't have any recent combat experience. Yeah, what are the kind gonna, of, sorry. Thinking, I mean, the US, this is why the United States, one of the reasons that we, United States keeps, you know, a Marine Corps and 18th Airborne Corps as specialist institutions around is because of the, sh of the difficulty in forced entry operations. And you've got to have smart people who spend all their time thinking about it, becoming proficient in planning them as well as executing them and making sure they get promoted if they do well at doing this. So if you don't have people who are being trained, who have, who can tap in to, if not accepted wisdom, at least uh, people who know, have a pretty good idea of how to do it, it's going to be very hard. So if, if you have to take a position on the uh, big debate going on at uh, War on the Rocks between this is an easy uh, invasion for China versus this is a hard invasion uh, for China, assuming it's an amphibious operation. Uh, where would you where would you put yourself on that thermometer from very hard to, to very easy? Oh, very, you know, this is the thing. This is again, uh, I, very little is easy. Uh, I would put it pretty felt not easy with the air superiority and the naval and the blockade. But, uh, you know, like I said, I've been a war game designer. I've even been to one real war and I didn't find anything easy there. So that was like like Clausewitz said, in war everything is easy, but even the easiest things are difficult. Yep. I mean, uh, obviously, no one. I mean, no one wants to see an unnecessary uh, disaster. And of course, this is not wishful thinking. But if the if if China were to attempt an amphibious landing and it were to go wrong, what are the three biggest things that are that that we're going to see go wrong with the amphibious landing? If it's you know a, a big cluster F, what would it look like? What would it? 
you know, I think would mean not having air superiority, uh, having something perhaps relatively cheap, like lots of minefields and an inability to clear minefields rapidly, or an inability to resupply, get things to the troops ashore that results of them uh, being like the Russians at the end of their uh, failing supply line uh, near Kiev. Yeah, I think I think the Russians, or rather the Soviets, did do an amphibious landing uh, on the isthmus that connected to Crimea during the Second World War. Yeah, they did that. Uh, they did uh, one near Kokenes in Norway. Uh, they did, of course, in the uh, Pacific in the last weeks of the war. They did a number, including uh, some on the China and Korean coast uh, with lend-lease equipment. So they have in a degree, and they. You know, and even though they didn't have the specialized equipment of the Americans or NATO during the uh, Cold War, it's certainly an issue they looked at. They had lots of amphibious shipping during the Cold War. So you, you identify, sorry, go on, Professor Kemp. Oh, the Chinese certainly have the capability of making an invasion of Taiwan uh, make a sea lion look like a well-planned operation. <laughs> um, I agree. They say the most difficult thing to do is an opposed invasion um, by sea. So I would, uh, even with airborne forces and everything else, this if it was that easy to do, they'd have done it already. Well, and China did, uh, 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 of course, there, there's different elements of difficulty, but at the, at the end of their uh, revolution, they, they did take over Hainan quite quickly. Mind you, it wasn't opposed. Um, How many aircraft carriers are backing Haina? Yeah, but I, 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 I guess the criteria was they could get the soldiers to the port, they could collect the boats, they could put the soldiers in the boats, they could wait for good weather and then get them across. So, you know, obviously a very low bar. Yeah, well, we saw recently too, I mean, obviously there's been press reports about the Chinese practicing with their civilian ferries, they re, they're going to rely on those in wartime to get their forces to Taiwan. And uh, I wish them luck with that. Yeah, no, that, yeah, there's a big debate as to as to to what extent those ferries, you know, uh, you know, yeah, at, at Dunkirk, the British were landing on friendly beaches with their with their small craft, not not people shooting at them. Yeah, and if you, you I mean, if you look, considerations which are going to limit their their time phasing to be able to accomplish something like this. Yeah, and I, I mean, obviously in, in high intensity combat, uh, probably up to 50% of the payload of any vessel that's crossing will be uh, supplies uh, and not troops. And that has, to, that has to be sustained if the artillery is gonna be able to do what it's supposed to do. Um, so a large, a large uh, factor in Ukraine's success obviously is uh, the will to fight. Um, uh, probably a change in political culture among the Ukrainian people to some extent. Uh, so Professor Isby, um, if you could send um, a Professor Miranda, specialist in uh, psychological warfare to collect data, what do we want to, what would we want to know about the Taiwanese uh, people and to see whether they're uh, more committed, less committed, as committed as the Ukrainians to their own independence? That's, uh, again, it's a, uh, that's a difficult question. And uh, if you could look at uh, perhaps, you know, talk to regional experts. The other would be looking at something which if you understand, if you fold it for a while, looking at anecdotes, but uh, it's very easy to be misled, you know, by, uh, you know, whether it's uh, in the one way or the other, you know, anecdotes, is well said is the, uh, you know, you put the anecdotes together, they don't necessarily lead you to data. Yeah, uh, Professor uh, uh, Chadwick, Frank Chadwick uh, mentioned that he believed there was a clear correlation between uh, motivation and level of education, basically. Um, uh, do you believe that? Uh, well, not, perhaps not necessarily, certainly, uh, a very poorly educated Russian population was motivated in the Second World War to fight very hard. 
And, uh, but again, you know, but normally these days, especially, you know, the rules have changed and, you know, what do, uh, you know, an educated population generally does better. You know, in the Second World War, middle class American soldiers uh, in the Pacific dealt better with the rigors of uh, jungle fighting than uh, people who came from poor backgrounds in the Depression. So education is a good thing. But, uh, you know, I would I'd be hesitant to uh, make a direct correlation. So I mean, again, sort of feeding back to the to the Taiwanese, what I mean, it's it's an awful question to ask. But if you had to rate the average Chinese soldier that would land in Taiwan and the average Taiwanese soldier, who would you give the edge, and by how much? Well, I might give the edge to the Taiwanese. You know, it's their homeland, and especially it could easily change if. Uh, you know, an atrocity, a charismatic leader, things which made a difference in the, in the Ukraine. It would be even better if you could have a system of saying, all right, let's try it better, in which you can play the game several times with the, with the different, you know, morale levels of one through four, zero through nine. If you could say, all right, we can make this, that we can see how much of the, it does it take a difference. Does it only make a difference if the Chinese are a one and the Taiwanese are an eight, or does even a step of difference make it, you know, change? So it would be great if you could make a design where that's the parameter, perhaps something where, you know, which compresses less detail. So you that, you know, in that case, you can see what the differences could be. Now, uh, none of none of the games you've designed have had sort of a, 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 a like a criminal criminalology kind of scenario where you've got factions playing it out in in Moscow. But you have written a lot on the Soviet Union, and certainly you're familiar with the Politburo and how they've decided things. China's got a very similar structure with uh, a, a political structure with a very different social structure. Um, what would you want to know? Uh, you know, given, you know, obviously, if you've designed war games, you must have thought about, you know, who's starting this war? How are they starting it? Why are they starting it? What would you want to know to uh, construct a decision making uh, game uh, of what's going on in Beijing and, and when these people are going to say go or don't go? Well, like I said, this is something how you could do it. This is why I suggested the old SPI plot to assassinate Hitler as the game or you could even flip it around and do it like a aftershock with five you know what are the factions within oh not just factions you know military or the central committee you know again a, play it as a cooperative game your game is not so much invading taiwan but here are five players each of which were different players in chinese internal politics such as they are however they're divided up and that's something i you know how i could do it if you wanted to do it that way and of course you'd have to have a someone who has a very good feel for chinese politics to avoid it just being a mirror image of someone else's uh, what, what would be the what would be the uh, indicators that we would want to use that uh, the Chinese have decided for war? Well, the, again, it's uh, very hard. We saw how difficult it was uh, before uh, you know, before Ukraine, but I suspect a lot of it's got to be economic because the Chinese are integrate even with the sanctions and trade wars, uh, the Chinese are integrated in the world economy to an extent that the Russians were not. So look for things like container movements. If the number of containers going to and from China changes dramatically, or if they are preparing for something where they're going to slap sanctions on them, then that's going to be uh, an indicator that may not have been there for the Russians in Ukraine. 
Yeah, if I if my World War II history is correct, I, I I'm I'm not an expert, so I, I may be wrong. I think the Americans did anticipate what the Germans and the Japanese were going to do by intercepting and seizing ships before the Germans or the Japanese, you know, when the Germans ultimately declared war, uh, were were they they had they hadn't anticipated that the Americans would move first. Um, so. Um, I guess I guess uh, the implication there is that um, they China may not be as organized as people think, or not be able to be able to organize itself as much as people think, because I, I think there's a Chinese expression, which is that Beijing is very far away; it's on the other side yeah. of a mountain, right? And so if you're if you're operating containers as a Chinese business person in Singapore, you're going to go, you know what? Thank you for the memorandum. Uh, you know you're far away, so I'll deal with it next month. Yeah, as you said, well, even simple things are hard in war as you prepare. So, you know, it's uh, it's easy to overestimate how nothing is saying. Oh, we could simply do that. So, yeah, I would uh, I would be reluctant to uh, to go with that. Again, as uh, far as <clears throat> things may be um, uh, not very plausible to the outside observer, uh, they can be to an autocratic society. Uh, when economic conditions get bad, again, I look back to the Falklands, and it's when the, you know, the Argentine uh, um, inflation rate got to about 400% that they, they turned like a lot of autocratic regimes and said, well, let's do something outside to pull the, pull the uh, country together. Uh, we do a foreign adventure and it gets us, uh, gets us a lot of, um, I got a, a lot of pay with the uh, with with our people who are otherwise not very happy with the internal situation. So taking Taiwan could be, uh, you know, they manufacture an incident and say, you know, we've got to uh, reunite them with the uh, with the mother country, even if it even if it's a silly thing to do. Yeah, I, I, if I may share some some insight on uh, the Falklands. Um, I, I actually, if I could challenge uh, your um, your description of the situation, uh, Professor Camps. So, and, and this is just you know, uh, there's there's a, a debate going both ways. But one one of the uh, one of the findings was that Galtieri actually had no interest in the Falkland Islands. He's army, of course. Um, he was focused uh, on Chile and and the uh, Beagle Channel dispute. And the um, it, it it produced the exact same effect that you're describing. But it was it was sort of complicated and attenuated. Uh, for Galtier to stay in power, he needed the support of Anaya, who ran the navy. The navy had its own air force, and their own carrier, and their own marine, so their own little mini army. And Anaya uh, had been um, uh, uh, asked by his boss when he was when he was not head of the navy to design a plan to invade the Falklands because, of course, that that would would be what would what would give the navy a bigger budget. So when Galtieri was in power and the inflation hit his popularity decreased. He actually had no interest in the Falkland Islands, but Anaya said, because it was a, like a triumvirate uh, in, in Buenos Aires, he said, listen, you want our support, you have to let the Navy plan for war. So Galtieri said, what the heck, yes. And he wasn't a very bright guy. And the Navy was like, all right, you know what, we're gonna run with this. And they came up with a plan. And the actual decision to move was, I think two weeks before the war actually started. So it was, there was causally a link between the inflation. It weakened the government. The government, the person in charge was desperate for whatever support he could get. The only people giving him uh, any support were the Navy. And so suddenly he became a Navy person and then boom, there was a, there was a conflict. Um, uh, obviously it took decades for, for uh, that information to come out uh, because we, you know, people had to write autobiographies. And unfortunately today all the principles are now dead. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's you know, sort of complicated political science, uh, uh, political science paths. Um, no argument there. So, uh, uh, Professor Isby, uh, could I ask you to speculate about uh, the strategic um, aspect? You showed uh, World War III, which is uh, Jim Dunnigan's game. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 because of the, the the games I was playing, I always um, default to Third Reich. You know, John John Prados's game. Um, if China were to go for uh, Taiwan, um, how do you think the countries would line up? I mean, who are the who are the stalwart pro Beijingers? And then the, the the sort of the free riders who are taking advantage of Western weakness, and then the neutrals, the big neutrals, 
um, that will assert their independence and, and not follow along the West? How, how, how do you think that the sides will, uh, that the countries will, will you know, uh, join the sides in the, in the dodgeball game? Yeah, I mean, certainly that's, you know, something you would like. One reason why a regional approach to a Taiwan game might be very interesting because, you know, would you end up with the, with the Republic of Korea and the Japanese on the same side? That would certainly uh, present issues for both of them, uh, even though neither one of them wants to see a resurgent China in the, taking, you know, by armed force. So that would be a crucial thing. Similarly, the Philippines, uh, Guam, what would happen to, you know, would they participate or allow, ba you know, it's certainly basing rates. What happens if there is an attack on Guam? What the Americans, you know, when the missiles hit American soil? So that's another issue. You know, I would think the American player needs to think about, you know, what is going to be that response? Similarly, the Japanese would have to uh, think about what their response would be if missiles come down on Okinawa or even uh, smaller islands like Sakashima. So in a bombardment scenario, obviously there's time, but if China were to bombard Taiwan or uh, uh, begin what looked like an invasion, would the U.S. intervene kinetically in the first 12 hours or not? Is it, it is the U.S. intervention automatic? I certainly certainly it has not been. You know, we're used to uh, years of them not answering the question, deciding that you know by keeping it indistinct, uh, not having a declaratory policy, it maximizes deterrent. So I'd say probably not. But uh, you know, what happens when deterrence fails, even in uh, even conventional deterrence? So we see uh, uh, Russia firing a lot of rockets and drones at Ukraine. Uh, and so, you know, two questions. Um, what effect is it having there? And so what, what effect should we expect it to have on Taiwan? And two, I, I, again, I, I, I don't want to give the impression I'm expecting a certain answer, but why can't Vladimir Putin see that it's not working? Well, it depends. What is, what is working for him? I mean, who does he, if he have to turn out all the lights in Kiev, or does he have to show the people that we are striking back at the time, you know, when, when our forces are being pushed back? Who is his audience? Like I said, is it for the military effects? Is he really playing? Is he playing? What game is he playing? Is he also, because he's maybe something that looks like the old SPI plot to assassinate Hitler, where certainly there are, you know, the oligarchs and Siloviki or the military all have interests that a mere cost-benefit analysis beyond that of, yeah, we're using a lot of rockets for blowing up power plants. So do you think uh, we're looking at a similar model for a Chinese bombardment of Taiwan, which is it's essentially a bunch of communist high-level people in Beijing impressing each other? That well, that could be. That is certainly. What do you respond to it? If it is missiles and you don't send airplanes, and of course, on the other hand, there's a lot of things in Taiwan which, unlike Ukraine, you really want to rip off the economy. Whereas in Ukraine, the they were once they'd stolen the uh, this year's harvest, uh, they were more than willing just to see things level. But to you know, you don't want if you've got the world's best uh, computer chips being made at Taiwan, and you are using them yourselves. Uh, you obviously don't want to flatten that factory or even turn its electric power off. Yeah, I mean, I, I think at the moment there is obviously a heavy investment from the U.S. government to move the um, the chip design is going to Arizona. I think. I mean, uh, uh, Silicon Valley is already fifteen percent Taiwanese. Uh, the chips are being manufactured now in China still, uh, but the design is is uh, in Taoyuan, which is that sort of sister city, the, the Taiwanese uh, Silicon uh, Valley. So if Putin is firing rockets uh, uh, to to you know give some satisfaction to the Russian people and the Russian military, at what point does uh, uh, would you estimate that the Russian military is going to turn around and go, um, 
Mr. Putin, you failed us. I mean, at what point is the institution going to have an identity and then demand from the political leadership competence? Well, that's <clears throat> it's hard to say. I think it's going to take a take an awful lot. It's very hard to see point out not only in autocracies when when the army has had enough and when it's going to force changes and the extent for the Russian military where political control has been bred in, something they inherited from the Soviet Union, uh, it's going to be hard for the armed military to say this. Uh, so I think they will stay, you know, the, I think the military would largely stay with Putin uh, through this, and especially if he can show them, all right, here's a way out, even if it is look like something like, now it's time to go for a war of attrition and let's declare a unilateral ceasefire. So, because uh, um, I, 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 I don't have, uh, it's not realistic, obviously, because we don't have a, a deep insight, but um, if you could put a number on it in terms of months, uh, are, are we looking at 12 months, 24 months, never possibly? Uh, you, well, possibly. I mean, what will, I would say you would, I'm saying you're looking at my, I, in part because of the stockpile failure, you are looking at the transition to something like you saw Arab-Israeli in the years between 67 and 73. Uh, first to a war of attrition, then a cold peace, and at some point uh, it's uh, Moscow's revenge. So that's just mine, but like I said, uh, it's an incomplete analysis, but that's what I'm looking at as the model. So th this war could go on for a very long time. I would bet on a long time. David, I have, I have a question. Do you think that the Russians are going to try for a winter offensive once the ground freeze is over? It would probably be a good idea if they could, a limited one, get, you know, whatever armored vehicles. You know, they desperately need a victory. So uh, I think if they could select to some place where they can get a limited objective and at least show them that you know we can push back the ukrainians in some place and you know there is going to be a lot of political demand we want a victory now so even right. if it's a small one all right thank you so if if, if, I, if I could um uh but I, I find that very interesting because i have, I have a, a colleague who's working on looking at uh, Russian chemical weapons and the idea that those would be useful in the spring because you can't use them as effectively in the winter, but definitely, um, I mean, there's opportunities for the Russians to move. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, Professor Isby, um, uh, the, hey, the hey, nine Dylan, guys, Oh, sorry. I don't know on. if you saw in the chat, I have to drop off. So I wanted to ask the one question I've been hanging on to for a <laughs> while now. This is, it's on modern warfare, but it's modern warfare of the 1980s. Um, do you mind if I share my screen here real quick? Please, yeah, uh, you're okay. clear. Okay, so um, I, I don't know if if Charles or David have looked recently on Amazon and see how much that their armies of the NATO Central Front goes for today. Um, it's $300 and there's used other used ones for 250 I actually had a colleague ask me, a gaming colleague asked me to ask you this. I told him I was going to be on the call tonight. Have you guys ever thought about redoing this book? Because everything from the 1980s is hot right now in commercial war gaming. They've reprinted Third World War. Compass Games has done that. NATO from Victory Games is being reprinted. There's a lot of, of 80s era Soviet US because a lot of the boomers and Gen Xers who would have been in the military then just want to know what would have happened. Have you ever thought about going back and maybe updating this book or other things that you wrote in that time frame? now that we've had a lot of declassified information, more information available with the end of the Cold War. I mean, for 300 bucks, I'd be tempted. I don't know how many would sell, but I know um, uh, my friend, he paid $360 for a copy of this book. Uh, stop laughing, David. I know the next war, Dunnigan's Game, is going right now on Board Game Geek. There's a new copy going for $260. So everything old is new again. I just was curious if there's, I mean, I know the the whole um, 
uh, full the gap, uh, full the gap is hard to get. That's expensive. But the five games that were done um, on like the Hoff gap and so forth, that five games was redone by Ty Bamba. A any ideas about redoing any of this stuff um, just uh, for old time's sake and maybe make some cash? Hmm. Well, I guess it's up to Jane's. <laughs> yeah, he may and, certainly, and, of course, I certainly wouldn't be opposed to a, it. Go ahead. Yeah, David, yeah, you were saying something? More, certainly, uh, the declassification show that, yes, you know, there was a, a NATO did the was able to hide a lot of its weaknesses, you know, things like uh, the people like British, especially were never in the 80s, but uh, post Falklands, they had a. a uh, Sorry, David. Yeah, you're breaking up. A year of victory and uh, which unfortunately did not survive Afghanistan and Iraq. Sorry, David, you, uh, you were you were broken up when you're answering the question. Could you please uh, restate it? Because I think it's very valuable. Oh, I was just saying yeah, that, well, not everyone has Freedom of Information Act, but the uh, British material that's been declassified on their 80s for structure shows that uh, they, you know, there were many weaknesses that were successfully papered over in the 1980s, especially with the with the victory in the Falklands, which uh, but uh, and the limitations in the British forces only became more apparent more recently in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And of course, we found out a lot more about the Soviet army as well. Um, your book was a standard that every battalion S2 I knew in the army had, <laughs> in addition to the FM 100, 1, 2, and 3 series. Um, by the way, that book is $227 on, um, on Amazon right now, so just saying. Um, you know, all things so <laughs> in 1980s are hot again. Just, just throwing that out there. <laughs> well, the main economy today is uh, selling to uh, university libraries, not necessarily to individuals. And so that $300 is actually a credible volume price. Um, because I'm, I'm, my books, for example, are in PDF in my library. And that's, that's mainly how, um, how the publishing companies uh, make their money. So that's not an unrealistic price. And frankly, it'd be really, really cool to get you to do a retrospective to, to evaluate your own methodology. People would be very <laughs> curious. And then to have it then pivot and look forward into the future. Looking at the Cold War and then turning it on Russia and China today would be really, really neat for people who are into that business. Yes, it, it would. We... Uh... Yeah, there's been a lot of great stuff declassified <laughs> from CIA and DIA under FOIA. It's amazing the amount of stuff CIA cranks out on a daily basis under 25-year mandatory declassification. I can't even keep up with it. <laughs> Not the great idea. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Mr. Dennis. Thanks. Um, I have to drop off, gentlemen. Thank you very much for tolerating me for the evening. I've enjoyed um, all of your games and continue to do so and uh, hopefully run into you someplace in the future. Thank you. Nice to have you with us. Thank Thanks. you. And ditto. Um, I definitely play the same, uh, the games with the same amount of interest. Um, so I mean, Mr. Fritz, I've got a, a, a yet another question on the political culture um, of the Chinese people and how we could, we could interpret it. A lot of the measures that, or rather a lot of the objectives that China's pursuing today, like the nine dash line in the South China Sea where they claim those islands, those were initially done by the Kuomintang while they were in Taiwan. So, uh, I mean, this is sort of, uh, uh, obviously it's, it's, it's difficult to parse out the interests because uh, of course, both you and Professor Camps have identified the particular nature of authoritarian governments and their needs to shore up legitimacy and pursuit of nationalism. But how much of what China wants is actually Chinese? Meaning it's what the Kuomintang and the CCP both agree on. How much of it is just, you know, the CCP you know, uh, uh, for their own institutional interest. Obviously, they want to end their their civil war with Taiwan. And how much of it is a Chinese authoritarian dysfunction? Like, I mean, we can imagine a democratic China where the Communist Party becomes some sort of social welfare organization. Uh, I mean, I know in Russia today, the Communist Party continues to criticize Putin because, you know, like Adolf Hitler, he's very close to the uh, oligarchs and not really taking care of the workers anymore. And the Communist Party can't be shut up because 
it, because it's a, you know, a, a, a blue collar organizations are powerful. So if we were to parse apart Chinese uh, nationalism, how would you do it? An interesting question. Uh... I mean, do we have to give, if China were to become democratic tomorrow and we wanted them to be democratic and we're negotiating with a democratic faction, do we have to give them the South China Sea? There, you know, it's certainly a lot of things, you know, that might be popular thing. I certainly know, uh, you know, with the Iranians who have, you know, a lot of Iranians who hate the current regime, uh, you know, says we've got to have a nuclear weapon. We live in a bad neighborhood. And the Shah also, you know, it was the Shah who originally started the Iranian nuclear program. So uh, national interests tend to, uh, tend to, uh, go from different types of regimes, as we saw for how much of the czarist era, both in the terms of internal repression and external diplomacy, was ended up being inherited uh, by Stalin and later. Far be it from me to try to um, figure out Chinese politics, but I know in the longer term, they've always figured that, um, that this past century was one of those times when uh, when China was not the top dog and uh, and no matter what their feelings are they want to be the top dog so I, I think even if you had a veneer of democracy come over China it may not change their territorial imperative for being a big growing country and that will go ahead and annex the South China Sea and continue with their Belt and Road Initiative and, and, uh, and want to replace us as the, uh, as the superpower. Uh, so P Professor Kemp, that's really a question, I guess, about uh, our interpretation of, of Western countries. I mean, we, we've had five centuries of power transition, you know, the sort of the standard Portuguese, Spanish to the Dutch to the English. And, and they, they've somehow, uh, you know, while they make these transitions, the, the international law has changed a little bit. But generally, the European powers in North America have had a, a, a way of um, interacting. What, what do you think the West or uh, the West plus Japan and South Korea um, would tolerate or, or, or uh, should accept or would accept? We have no idea what we'd be capable of accepting because we thought the Chinese for ever, ever since the Nixon era that the Chinese were going to go democratic and and everything was going to be you know sunshine and roses and it never happened and I can't see it happening either uh, so I you know I'm not really sure I'm not I don't have a really good feeling about what we're able to accept what we're forced to accept depending on what our administration happens to be. I, I, could I conjecture that? The uh, Chinese people along the coast, and I think this, I think this came up uh, in, in a previous discussion, the Chinese people along the coast um, in China are more liberal and more close to democracy than um, uh, the Russian people. Mm -hmm. Is that, what, what, do you, what do you think of that? Yeah, but uh, do, you, do you know what democracy is? Democracy is two wolves and a sheep deciding what's for dinner. Oh. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, no, possibly. So, um, uh, so uh, 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 Professor Isby, um, if for uh, sorry, if, if I if take the long view um, on China, um, uh, I, I basically, I'm looking for an inflection point where eyes will no longer focus on Beijing and will drift away. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm curious. With India, you have a country that's got twice the arable land almost uh, going to suppress China and population, 1.45 uh, billion. Um, um, much younger population, which means uh, a population that's gonna be able to work in the factories. Um, uh, a, a water source that comes with the monsoons and doesn't depend on uh, the climatological changes happening in the, with the glaciers in the Himalayas. Um, and a very confident, if uh, poorly understood, um, revolution in, in political culture as literacy is going from, I mean, right now it's about 75%, 50% for women and about 90% for men in India. 
and that literacy is bringing with it uh, a fairly aggressive, assertive Hinduism. And I'm wondering, I mean, if you, it's the old rule, we don't want to pick a fight to the death with our future ally. I mean, it gets, I mean, we've, we've been playing this balance of power game, uh, you know, for centuries now, you know, where, where you know, we, we've, uh, millions of people have died fighting for a regime and then, you know, we defeat them and then everyone's got to reorient painfully. Um, uh, 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 what, what do you think about the, uh, the idea that we have to uh, canal China, sort of uh, canal them uh, into a position of them being our best hope to deal with India in about 50 years? <laughs> well, uh, that, I mean, the Indians certainly uh, are not at the level of the Chinese, you know, even though they certainly, as much as they desperately would like to be on the UN, one Security Council. Uh, but if you look at indeed things like you know, the number of container movements, the number of internal airlines miles flown, there's still, despite the rising population and the youth, uh, still much less externally focused, not as much a part of the you know of uh, globalization as the Chinese proven to be even before the mo the rose the COVID and uh, similar impacts. So yeah, what is uh, China was originally you know famously characterized as the the sleeping dragon, but uh, India still has a lot of potential which it never seems to quite touch. Yeah, in 2000, uh, China's economy was still less than the UK. And, uh, you know, now it's, it's uh, four fifths of the US economy. So, you know, in 20 years, uh, you can have an enormous, enormous economic change. Mind you, I think it, it's a similar problem with assessing the Soviet economy during the Cold War. I think, uh, frankly, most of China's transformation occurred uh, under the Communist Party between 1970 and 1990 in the form of education and infrastructure that is just not detectable economically. And all, all the government had to do is turn the key, allow innovators to innovate, and then boom. Um, but I mean, even today, India leads China in um, the number of engineers that do uh, uh, nuclear engineering. And even today, India's got more nuclear reactors than China. Um, China uh, had three breeder reactors, one of which uh, possibly malfunctioned. And you know, there, there's some thoughts that the Chinese uh, chose not to manufacture a lot of nuclear weapons because they're highly confident that no one could defeat them, even with nuclear weapons. And Mao would boast that all the time. But the alternate explanation is just China. Uh, China was just bad at nuclear engineering, and so it got it just couldn't build that many nuclear weapons. And even today, it's got uh, about the same number of nuclear weapons as France. I mean, mind you, they're thermonuclear weapons, and and China did. Uh, 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 China, I think it took four years for China to go from a bomb in '64 to a thermonuclear weapon. I think it was 68 or maybe 70, but you know, certainly about half a decade. And by their fourth test, they already had it on a rocket um, and it detonated at the end. So the China did figure some stuff out. Um, uh, sorry, would you like that? Would you like that? Sorry. One thing I can say without fear of contradiction, India is not going to be invading Taiwan. Now, the, uh, the reason I bring that up is that in some of our planning exercises at ACSC, we actually had seminars. They were all trying to do all this diplomatic wrangling and various things like that. And so, no, the reason for this exercise is combat. You're, you're trying to plan something that's going to happen, which is kinetic. So forget the stuff. Somebody else is handling that. You have to handle the combat planning. So if we're looking at a war game with China versus Taiwan, maybe we ought to re revert to China invading Taiwan, or no, blockading I, it, or something else. No, de definitely, you're, definitely, you're right, uh, uh, Professor Camps. There's enough, there's enough puzzles just to solve that uh, conundrum, uh, which is, you know, huge unknowns. Uh, but uh, in in defense of of uh, sort of an, uh, a, a brief India perspective, um, India wouldn't be going after Taiwan. Uh, they'd be going after the the the, the uh, Persian Gulf, which is. Uh, you know, two hours away by aircraft. I, I know they have an Atlantic maritime surveillance aircraft every hour of every day at the Straits. So India's had a presence there for 20 years. And um, there, are, there are more than a million Indian workers uh, in the Persian Gulf. And, um, you know, uh, if, if I was in the Emirates, I would be concerned just looking at demographics 20 years from now, because it's, you know, I, um, 
in, in some respects, the U.S. has spared the, the horror of China being next to the world's oil supply, <laughs> where India is. And so that's going to be, you know, a, a separate kind of um, uh, issue. Um, so if, if I could, uh, sorry, Professor Isby, uh, um, uh, we're, we're at the end. So if I could ask you, you know, just sort of one final um, uh, 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 question um, on this issue. Uh, and I'm sorry, you know, trying to reflect on, you know, if I had one question on more gaming, um, um, yeah, uh, what would it be? What do I need? Um, yeah, so it, 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 in one minute, could you give us a, a if you had a you know a, a large piece of paper and um, a cardboard uh, to answer the question of uh, could China take Taiwan in an invasion or a bombardment? Um, what you know what would what would you uh, what would you have? I mean, in terms of zones of control, like sort of a very brief checklist. Uh, you know, like I said, if you uh... I showed just many ways you could do this. You know, if I was given to do it, if you needed it tomorrow, I would do something like uh, get Mark Herman's uh, Gulf Strike and uh, plagiarize. Uh, you know, and well, no, no one plagiarizes in the game design. You know, mature mature artists steal. It's only the immature that imitate. Uh, so get some approach like that. But I, that would be I wouldn't really find that as satisfactory and. Uh, you know, like I said, and the question being, speak, to, you know, get to the people who know that. And like I said, what is the, you know, what is the essence? And I showed you the ways it can be, you can do it from just this map, like we're looking at now of Taiwan to uh, global to individual soldiers. And you can take that to the Ukraine. The, you know, the get, uh, you can create realities more than, you know, and more so than any novelist, yet you're limited, but you have to use the agree real facts as you can find them. So this is the thing. You are creative. You, you got to be creative. That's the great thing about being a game designer. So I might, uh, like I said, if I probably come out with a game in which, despite the Chinese things, an invasion of Taiwan isn't going to look really good. And uh, it's nothing that, and I think uh, it's something where you couldn't really have saying this is going to be a uh, vic you know, an Anschluss 38 victory march. No, thank you very much. Um, I, 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 of course, would also include uh, Professor Miranda's uh, Taiwan game and Professor Camp's uh, four kilometer to the hex uh, invasion. And uh, I would do it all, um, but it would take hundreds of hours to play the game. Um, I, I, I just want to say, uh, you know, one last thing. This morning there was a China Power Conference at CSIS, and that's where uh, there were very knowledgeable people on China, including a former member of the uh, Guomintang, uh, a person who just retired from the CIA. Um, but none of them were uh, speaking with the level of detail that we could get from people who war game these big events. And so, um, you know, just it's just to underline, it's fantastic having area specialists. Uh, but it would be even better if they could operationalize their ideas into something where we could test uh, doctrine and policies yeah. and, you know, just uh, uh, a fundamental um, uh, approaches to deterrence. So thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor uh, Isby. I know thank it's you. been a very, very long discussion, but incredibly uh, valuable insights from your long uh, work in wargaming and scholarship. So thank you well, very thank much. You.